Draft Mechanic is a proud member of Punchboard Media. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com. Draft Mechanic, episode 98. On this episode of Draft Mechanic, we've got a Kickstarter preview of Freshwater Fly, we discuss recent plays at Bococo and the Ark of the Covenant, we've got a six-pack review of Otis, which we're also putting on tap, Jake gives us a beer traveler for Augusta, Georgia, and listener Will Foy tells us about the Unpub convention this year. So sit back, relax, grab a pint, and enjoy the show. You've seen the future and it works Hello and welcome back to another episode of Draft Mechanic. I'm Jake. And I'm Danielle. And Draft Mechanic is the podcast about board games and craft beer and anything we can do to tie the two together. Here at Draft Mechanic, we like our beer like we like our board games. Uh, From the very, very colorful all the way to the deepest, darkest depths. Certainly on this episode. (laughs) Yeah, we've got Picoco, which is a super bright and colorful game. We've got Otis, and as you were saying, most pretty much everything in the on tap there is super dark beers. Which is, I guess, not surprising, since in Otis you are salvaging the deepest, darkest depths of the ocean. Frankly, I think it's a nice turnaround, because a lot of times we've had on taps which are almost (laughs) entirely IPAs. Here we've got almost entirely porters and stouts with one IPA snuck in there, because it's not so much themed on the diving part of Otis as it is on that crazy shark that I love so much. Yes, uh, listeners out there, the runner-up for what things were like this episode was just sharks, because we'll talk about the shark and Otis a little bit later. But hey, if this is your first time tuning in, thank you so much for joining us. DraftMechanic.net is your one-stop shop for all your Draft Mechanic needs, at Draft Mechanic on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the usual stuff. We've also got a Board Game Geek Guild that is guild number 2470. There will be a thread up for this episode, as there is for every episode, so if you're listening to this and you've got something to tell us about what we're saying, that is the place to do it. And as I've been saying over the last few episodes... I think you've mentioned it once or twice. We do have a Board Game Geek Micro Badge, and we would love it if y'all would pick it up, it is available on the guild and also, you know, all the usual places. If you need the geek gold to pick that up, let us know in that thread and either Jake or I will throw you that eight geek gold so you can get it. Yeah, there's that thread on the guild, but we are at 90 out of my goal of 100 micro badgers before episode 100. So big thanks to Jason Lees, Luke Dixon, and Sarah Mahood Warmoth for picking that up. If other 10 other people want to pick it up, that would sure make me happy. And I'm sure we could find something special to do for micro badgers at episode 100, perhaps. Perhaps. Micro badgers. Do we? We haven't, we haven't thought of it yet, but we might be able yes. to. So, if you would like to join the micro badgery or the, is that a thing? Can I say micro badgery? The micro. You can say badgemov? whatever you like. Badge- it doesn't make any sense. Micro badgemov. There you go. What? That's a, I don't know. Let's move on. Danielle, save me. Tell us about something else we, that's going on. If you happen to be in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, we do twice monthly gaming meetups. The next is on the first Thursday of every month. It is going to be on April fourth at Good Road Cider Works. It is on the first Thursday of every month. Mm-hmm. But this one is going to be on the first Thursday of April. And then we also do one on the third Tuesday of every month at Salud Cerveceria in the Noda neighborhood. So if you want to check that out and you're not able to make this Thursday, Mm -hmm. that will be later in the month. Yes. And I'm really excited for this Thursday. Uh, We're talking with Will Foy, one of our listeners and friends of the show, later on in this episode. But this Thursday uh, is Will's going away party because he's moving up to Baltimore. But we are going to play Carcassonne with him as a very special moment of the Carcassonne. So I'm super looking forward to that. Will's never played Carcassonne. And that's why this is weird. <laughs> I didn't specifically want to say that, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get Will some good carcassonne before he goes off into the the northern northern areas. Uh, one little bit of moving sh- to Maryland. That's north or northern of us, you know. Oh, okay, it's colder up there. Uh, one little bit of show news: there are still just a few of the free tickets available for our Geekway bottle share that we are doing with the Mile High Game guys. You can go to boardgames.beer/events for more info on that. It is Thursday, eight p.m. in the Calhoun room in the Embassy Suites, and of course. Anybody else going to Geekway, if you are going to Geekway and you want to meet up for a game, say hey uh, us on Twitter and, you know, at Draft Mechanic, all that usual thing. That's a, a good place to do it. Before we move into Kickstarter news, I wanted to bring up one sort of beer news thing. Mm-hmm. A while back, I want to say in February of last year, in February of 2018, Stone Brewing had brought a lawsuit against Keystone because they had tried to shorten Keystone Light's mm-hmm. name to Stone Light. And they had done this whole big advertising campaign. And Stone's idea was they had worked hard to present a brand which was associated with their name, and it was associated with independent brewing. And 
Keystone shortening the name of their product to Stone was infringing on the I don't want to say it's the the branding, but it it was infringing upon their rights as as a direct competitor to Keystone Light. You can't just name something the same as your competitor and sell it in the same marketplace. Hmm. This has just recently gone through initial court proceedings to see if there was any merit to this lawsuit. And they found that because Stone is distributed nationally, which it is now, and it is possible that Keystone Light and Stone beers might be sold in the same section of the same stores, and because Stone had a recognizable brand, that this was a legitimate lawsuit that had merit. So it's going to be allowed to continue forward. And it doesn't really mean anything at this point because there is still the entire lawsuit to go through and the court may find that it is or is not an infringement. But I think it is interesting that it is even getting this chance because originally when it was brought, it was one of those things that was like, okay, Stone is taking on Keystone Light. That feels sort of David and Goliath, but it's interesting to see that this is at least going forward. And that has come about in the last I want to say two weeks or so. Yeah. So I'm, I'll be interested to follow that going forward just to see because it's important to protect your branding if you're going to stake a claim to it. That's something that we've heard time and time again when you talk about magic clones in board gaming. Mm. Like the reason that magic had to go after certain people is because if you don't protect your IP, then you lose the right to protect your IP in the future. So it's interesting to see Stone staking this claim and actually getting to take it forward. Hmm. Yeah, I'm interested to see that continue to move forward. It's going to hopefully establish some precedence in some way, which is pretty much all I know about laws and lawsuits is that they establish precedence. Sounds good to me. Yeah, I saw that on TV once. Danielle, <laughs> let's move on to Kickstarters, because as I predicted a few weeks ago, the Kickstarter marketplace is getting a big jam packet. Of. Danielle, will you give us the updates from the last episode? Sure. High Rise from Formal Ferret Games funded with $52,879 of its $50,000 goal with 858 backers. I'm super duper duper excited and glad for Gil. This game is great and everybody should pick pick it up. Everybody get this game. I know. I mean, they probably did get hurt with the fact that it was a relaunch, Mm -hmm. but I'm hoping that the backers that do get this game see how amazing it is and it will get maybe some after-release boost from that. Yeah. Winterborn from Talon Strike Studios, funded with $42,118 of its $20,000 goal, 1,179 backers, and they unlocked all the dang stretch goals, so that's nice. exciting. Glenmore 2 from Fun Tales is funding at $161,624 of its $39,392 goal with 2,692 backers. This Kickstarter is still running until April 11th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Mm-hmm. And then Thrive from Adam's Apple Games, funded with $24,051 of its $8,000 goal. This one had 637 backers. So of those, only Glenmore is still running. But we've got more projects that you can talk about, (laughs) new ones. All right. Well, I'm going to kick it off with one from our sponsors, Gray Fox Games. This is Sukuyumi Full Moon Down. It's currently funding at 340k of its 150k goal with 2,242 backers. This one ends April 12th at 6 p.m. Eastern with an estimated delivery of January next year. So if you've heard our ads over the last few episodes, you have a vague idea that the theme for this is extremely odd. Bonkers feels like the correct word. This is a big box. Fox miniatures game, which is kind of uh, something that Gray Fox has not done a lot of, you know, beyond like Champions of Midgard is probably their biggest big box kind of game. And this is going to just knock it out of the park on that. So there's three kind of different pledge levels to look at here. 99 bucks gets you the full base game. $149 adds an expansion that brings it up to a six-player play count instead of just four. And then at $249, you add a solo mode, a giant play mat, two additional factions, which brings it to a total of 187 miniatures. Dag. Which is insane. And I gotta say, like, honestly, the quality of product on this looks super, super good. Uh, which is really cool to see. I'm excited to see what all this finally looks like. Do they have the minis in actual picture form, or is it just pre-rendered? I think it's pre-rendered stuff. Um, You know, just looking through there, it looks like it's pretty pre-rendered. Okay, Um, so we'll have to see. Yeah, we'll have to see how it comes out. 
Uh, this is a game that was never really on my radar because I'm not really a dudes on a map, fighty fighty kind of guy. But if you are, this looks like it's got a lot of stuff in it that appeals to those kind of fans. Uh, it's asymmetric, faction based territory control with a whole ton of minis. Uh, they're bringing this over from King Raccoon Games that published it for a Kickstarter, I think, um, last year at some point with standees. And they're adding in all the minis and the deluxified stuff into this version. Um, our buds, the Mile High Game Guys, also p- part of Punchboard Media did a review of this one two weeks ago. I'd encourage you to check it out. I'll put um, a link in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, Adrian from the Mile High Game Guys is quoted on their Kickstarter page, uh, like, holy S, this is good, which is surprising because that's not really Adrian's game. You know, he's notably like super did not like Rising Sun, for example, and a lot of those dudes on a map negotiation kind of games. I think one thing that is really interesting about Tsukuyumi to a lot of people is that it's no dice, no randomness. Everything is straight deterministic about how you're going to move around and control areas. So if that's the kind of thing you've been looking for in this kind of game, I'd encourage you to at least give this one a look. It certainly can't be accused of having a dry theme, that's for sure. Yeah, this is this is some stuff. Second up, we have Gartenbau, which is from Fisher Heaton Games, actually a local publisher to us here in Charlotte, though uh, David just moved down to Florida. So congratulations on moving. Hope things are going well for you down there. It's currently on its way to funding 5,978 of the 19,350 goal with 130 backers. This one ends on April 22nd at 10 p.m. Eastern with an estimated delivery of January 2020. The base game is 37 bucks. The deluxe edition that includes a play mat and a tile tower and a deluxe first player token is $59. This one is an abstract garden building game where you're planting seedlings, kind of like domino style tiles that have one color of a seedling on each half of the tile. And you're aligning those tiles and placing them into your personal garden and then using color adjacency to plant specific plants on top of those tiles. So you'll get from the seedling domino tiles, you'll have a you know two by one square plant that you plant over two seedlings of colors that you know match there. And it's all based on color theory. So if you, you know, had a yellow and a red seedling next to each other in your setup, you could place an orange flower on there if you pay the required resources, so on and so forth. And then the goal from there is to have the plants next to each other that allow you to place a kind of two by two tile that is a flower and you're drafting the flowers at the beginning of the hand and all of your flowers have different scoring conditions that will obviously give you different score stuff based on your setup of your garden like there was one that counts the number of edges in your garden there's one that counts stuff adjacent to flowers there's one that wants you to have flowers next to flowers so on and so forth a bunch of different things in there and having that drafting allows you to build that strategy in the beginning of the game. One thing I will say is even though this is a very color heavy game, they've done a very good job of making sure that even if you have problems differentiating colors, Mm -hmm. every color is a different shape of flowering plant and of flower on the flower tiles themselves. So if you are looking at the tiles, you'll be able to tell them apart, even if you can't necessarily distinguish all of the colors. Mm -hmm. And all of the flowers, I believe, have an icon that tells you what plants need to be underneath them. So a red flower could be two red, or say a, an orange flower could be a red and a yellow or two orange, and there are icons that show you the shape of those flowers. So they've done a very nice job making this colorblind friendly for a game that is so color reliant. Yeah, as a really smart design decision, I really got to hand it to Will Meadows from Tantrum House is actually the artist on this game. He did oh, nice. the art and the graphic design. So it was cool. I didn't know that he did that kind of stuff, and it really worked out really well in this game for those exact reasons you said. Tantrum House, also a member of Punch yeah, Party. Very, yeah, very true. So we've had a chance to play this. Um, you know, obviously being a local designer, he brought it by one of our game nights. I've played it twice. And I really enjoy watching my garden grow out under me. And it is kind of fun in a way to play something that you'll... 10 turns later, you'd be like, oh, well, crap, why did I place that seedling there? This is going to always be in the way of this particular thing that I'm trying to achieve. It was really fun to watch it grow. One of the things I really liked about this game is you had to really balance whether you wanted to rush the game and try to get the game finished by completing your flowers quickly, but not growing a lot of extra plants, which are Mm -hmm. going to get you points, or whether you want to wait and maybe develop your garden a little more so that you get more points for the flowers that you're playing into the garden. Because some of the flowers are going to give you points for other tiles that are laid within your garden. So there really is that sort of push and pull. Do I want to rush the game and give up on extra points? Or do I want to let the game sort of go a little bit longer and 
take a chance that maybe somebody else will get a flower out, but also that I'll get to get more points from my flowers. And that's an interesting decision, I felt like. Yeah, so I'm really interested to see how this one goes. Again, that's Garden Bow from Fisher Heaton Games. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes as we do. Mm-hmm. But check it out. If you're looking for an, a really colorful and interesting abstract like that, maybe this is one for you. Third up in Kickstarters, I have a game called Handsome, which is the latest button shy games, the little wallet games we talked about on last episode. This is designed by TC Petty 3. It's funding at $6,486 of its $1,000 goal with 421 backers, though uh, you can add one more to that because I backed it after we took these numbers. This one ends on April 6th at 1030 a.m. Eastern with an estimated delivery of July 2019. I love the turnaround on these two being such a small product. It's so easy, well, quote unquote, easy to produce and get them shipped out. And they've been pretty consistent about getting them out in that quick turnaround time. Mm-hmm. So you can back this for 10 bucks to get the game plus the mini expansion. This is a word construction game with just 18 cards. Depending on player count, you're going to deal out a few consonants to each player and a few visible to the table. Each player is going to play a card to the center as well as, you know, have two cards remaining in their hand. So you're going to have five letters in the center and two cards private to you. And you're going to fashion words based out of the public and private letters. They're all consonants. So everything else is going to be you filling in letters a la wordsy, something like that, where you're adding extra letters to it. You're going to score a point if you have the most letters of a specific suit in your word, because the 18 cards are split up into three suits. You have necklace cards, bolo cards, and bow tie cards. Of course you do. Yes, because it is about getting dressed up for a fancy party. With letters, I guess? And whoever has the longest word is also going to gain a point, and the first to nine points wins. It's super portable, and it's super quick and easy to understand and learn. And I feel like this one is going to be the kind of small pocket game that you can take to any family gathering because everybody can do a word thing. And this is a really simple rule set that encourages you to think about putting those letters together in a different way. I think that's a really awesome design. And frankly, I really think Button Shy is on a roll this year. You know, we talked about a few last time, but they've had super tall Sprawlopolis. There was the A Perfect Moment, which just came in in the mail in the last few days. Looking forward to checking that out. There was Anthelion, which is, I think, a retheme of one of their older games. And then this one is getting a lot of talk up in a, up front anyway. I would say if you are interested in what Button Shy is doing, go check them out on Patreon as well because they have a bunch of different board game of the month club levels. I think for five bucks a month, you can get a game mailed to you monthly. Not one of these full wallet games, but like a postcard game with a little rule set, maybe bring dice or a pencil or like one or two tokens with you. But it's a really cool way to support this kind of design constraint idea. And I'm looking into, you know, seeing more of what they do in the near future. Apparently, there is a spinoff game of Circle of the Wagons on the way called Circle the Dragons that will have 37 cards. Nope, Ooh, can't get behind it. And a few tokens. That's just too much. I can't put that in a leatherette wallet. <laughs> I'm willing to take a look at it. But yeah, that is TC Petty's Handsome from Button Shy Games. All right, well, we're not done with Kickstarters quite yet, but this one's going to come after the break because we got a full Kickstarter preview. Yes, it's another Brian Surrey game, and this one's called Freshwater Fly. Want to wear your draft mechanic pride to your local brewery, board game meetup, or board game meetup at a brewery? Check out redbubble.com slash people slash draft mechanic for t-shirts. Okay, so we've got a full Kickstarter preview of Freshwater Fly. This is on Kickstarter right now from Bellwether Games. It's funding at 43k of its $24,000 goal with about 590 backers. This one ends on mm, April 25th at 9 p.m. Eastern with an estimated delivery of September later this year. You can back it for $49 for the basic game or the $64 version you really want that comes with uh, wooden fly tokens and wooden drag tokens, wooden finesse tokens, and a fancy casting token that looks like a real handle. And I just got to say, I'm so excited for Brian Surrey, the designer of this game. This is the second game in a row that he's had on Kickstarter, and this one is already well past its funding goal. So A+, plus, awesome. Congrats, Brian. I'm so excited to see you succeed. We I've loved your designs in the past. And Danielle, you want to talk about this one? Sure. In Freshwater Fly, you are unsurprisingly a fly fisherman, because that would be kind of weird if that's not what you were. <laughs> The board is divided into six sections, and it represents the river that you are fishing in. Players are going to take turns casting their fly into the river and attempting to hook a fish and then reel that fish in. The way that's going to be done is through a dice drafting mechanic. So at the beginning of each round, you're going to roll all the dice, and players are going to take one die at a time, and that will either represent where into the river they're going to be casting their fly, you know, which of the six sections, depending on the number on the die, or how much they're reeling in their fish if they've already hooked a fish. If you're attempting to catch a fish, you take the die and you cast into that section. You'll place the 
casting pawn onto one of the fish in that section. Each section has either two or three fish, depending on whether there's a rock in it. And the player to your right will shuffle up this four card catch deck and they'll flip a card up for you. One of those cards has a catch on it. And if that's the case, you take the fish that the pawn is on and you'll put it in front of you. And that's the fish you've hooked or attempting to reel it in. If not, you will drift slightly downstream, so to the next section of the river, and assuming that that section also has a token corresponding to the fly that is on your line, then you will attempt to catch a fish again, but this time you get two cards. If you manage to hook the fish, you will take that fish. If you don't, you will drift again, and unfortunately, after two drifts, you're going to have to cast again because your your line has gotten all out of sync or whatever. Assuming that you've hooked a fish, which you have a very good chance of doing, you have a naturally, hopefully, three out of four chance of hooking that fish, and you can use finesse, which is sort of a wild resource, to make that a better chance. Assuming you've hooked a fish, on your future turns, you're going to be drafting dice to reel this fish in. You've got a reel on your personal player board, which is actually a nice little moving three-dimensional thing where you're actually reeling the token around and it has five sections every time you reel through all five sections you're going to move your fish to the section above your player board closer to being caught once it gets all the way to the left of your player player board you have reeled it in all the way and you are going to take that fish and put it into your caught pile each fish has a certain point value once you've caught it, and each player board has specific fish that you'll get extra points at the end of the game for having caught. Generally, it's combinations, or perhaps it's types of fly that you've used to catch those fish. Different combinations of those will give you extra points. So every player is trying to get slightly different fish throughout the game, which means that everybody's going to be going for different sections of the river and using different kinds of flies. You'll go until somebody has caught seven fish, And once a player catches seven fish, you will finish out the round and you will add up the points from all the fish that you've caught and all the additional bonuses that you've gotten from the bottom of your player board for your personal objectives. And whoever has the most points wins. One thing I didn't really touch on is there are those rock cards that I had mentioned in the river. These are going to give you extra powers that may allow you to change the number on the die that you draft or perhaps allow you to cast an extra time if you are in a certain section of the river. They they have all different powers and they will persist throughout the game with, I think, one exception, their persistent (laughs) powers. So as the game continues, everybody's going to have a little bit of a different way that they're going about their fishing and what they're trying to get and what powers that they have. There are also some special power tokens that allow you to maximize your turns. And you're, again, like I said, trying to get the most points with the fish and most points is the winner. Catch that fish, get that fish. Yes, that is the Catch That Fish song. I mean, the game says you're supposed to say hit me when you want one of those fish catching cards from that little four card deck. But I feel like the Catch That Fish song is way more fun. I will say that saying hit me is in the rules and it is required to receive a strike card. Well, if you're playing Freshwater (laughs) Fly with me and you sing the Catch That Fish song, I'm going to let you have a card. (sighs) Yes, Freshwater Fly. So this is not a sequel to Coldwater Crown. This is another game that is in a similar universe, but it doesn't have any really similar mechanics, which I think a lot of people might have just kind of assumed in the beginning. But one thing I found was... The fishing universe. The fishing universe of fish. One thing I uh, thought was really interesting from talking to Brian Surrey about this is that this is actually the first game that he's designed with the theme in mind. So it's fun in a way to see how he ended up designing a game that works thematically based on what he wanted to make the game about. Like... Everything in the game feels thematically right. I love that kind of rondelle of your casting reel where you're, you know, reeling in a fish. I love the fact that if you don't catch a fish, your fly is going to drift down the river. I think that there's so many interesting, like, thematic choices for the mechanics in this game. And I just, like, from day one of playing this, I'm freaking in love with it. The drifting mechanic that you mentioned is also really neat because, like I said, In order to catch a fish in the section of the river, there has to be a token beneath that section that matches the color fly you have on your line. Mm -hmm. So if you are selecting a die to cast into the river and there's only a few left, maybe you were the last person to pick in a round and it wasn't your first action of the round. So maybe there's only two or three dice left. You may have to cast into a section where if you drift... There isn't a token of the color you've got the fly on. And at that point, you have to make a choice. Do I want to change the fly before I cast and Mm -hmm. perhaps allow the tokens to shift down as they will at the end of the round? Do I want to take my chances and hope that I catch that fish and maybe spend some extra finesse 
which I really want to save for something else. Maybe I'll have to spend it to catch an extra fish because you can spend a finesse to get an extra card from that deck. And I think it's really kind of interesting when you get down to the lower values of dice. And I say lower values of dice because a lot of times people are going to be taking the higher values. Mm -hmm. But if you do take lower values, you're probably going to get to go first in the next round because the player with the lowest total dice drafted in a particular round is going to go first on the next round. Mm -hmm. I think also a really interesting part of that is that since there is a number of dice that does not evenly distribute to player count, whoever was first player in a round is going to end up with three dice, pretty much ensuring that first player is always going to be changing every single turn of the game. Unless that person takes some very, very <laughs> low dice, which you might do, because yeah. there are times when you don't want a high-value die. There are no useless dice in this game, I feel like, mm -hmm. because anything can either be two extra finesse points that you wanted, or maybe you just want to cast into the lower value end of the river because that's where the tokens are for you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, you might have all the different options available, but depending on where your casting reel is in your rondelle, it might behoove you to take a lower number to get one of the special effects off of those spaces. This is something that I think is really interesting, and this is the first time I've seen Brian really attack a quote-unquote free action abundance in a game. You're only going to be taking the one action of drafting a die, and doing one of those actions, but based on your uh, your finesse token, based on some momentum tokens that you can get, depending on if you land on a certain space on your reel, and some other you know options that you get from rock cards, he's really added in a lot of free actions that you can take to kind of manipulate what you have available to you. You've talked about the finesse and how you can spend a point there to change your fly or change the die number one thing. Uh, but you also have these momentum tokens that if you land on the third, I think it is, space of your reel there, you get to take one of these tokens up at the top, and they're all really cool single-use powers. Like, there's one that you can move a hatch token left or right in the river and then cast into column three, or I don't you know if that's exact, but, you know, those kind of things that give you extra free actions by acquiring these tokens and spending them. I love having those opportunities because it really encourages me to change what dice I'm selecting rather than always saying I need the biggest die all the time because that's the only thing that's going to be an advantage for me. Well, yeah, and those tokens, once you spend them, they get flipped over to their opposite side, which has a different power, and they go back. So if you were collecting a couple of them, you can spend more than one at a turn, and then you can absolutely completely change the options that are available for somebody on their turn if they're going after you, because when they flip over, they get placed back up there, and if another person can take one of them, depending on where their real lands, they can get those extra actions or different extra actions and make more of their turn. Mm -hmm. the, th the word I always bring to the table when I'm talking about Brian's designs is interlocking. And I think that this game has it just as much as Winterborn, a few episodes we talked about, in that any die you take, you're going to have to choose how you're going to use it, what it's going to do for you, what other kind of special benefits you're going to get off on it. And it it's going to change the circumstance of the game. And it's a really interesting way to interconnect all of these mechanisms. Um, I super, super love this game. And I'm really excited to get this when it does finally, uh, you know, get the finished production out. Yeah, this is one that our group was very happy to see come to table a bunch. Mm -hmm. We had a really fun time every time we were playing it. And I think that that is a testament because we're not fishers. I mm -hmm. mean, the first player rule in this game is ostensibly the last person to catch a fish. We have never had more than one person playing this game who has ever caught a fish. Steven I don't will believe. always be first player in this game. So <laughs> we are not like super fish friendly, fishing friendly, I guess. Mm -hmm. But everybody always had a fun time when this came out and was asking for this to come out again. So I'm excited about it. What you're saying is we're not aficionados. It's not what I was saying. Come on, aficionados. No, that's what you're saying. A fishing aficionados, yeah? I don't know. Freshwater Fly, it's on Kickstarter right now. Really, it's like, super go check this one out. It, it's super cool, and I'm a big fan. Through April 25th. <laughs> yes, thank you. Danielle, sometimes life can take you to some weird and interesting places. And one of those places that I find myself so often in is a detour into the, the Carcazone! 
I'm running out of chances to use that knob. I'm, I'm, well, I, I say running out, but I never expected to find this particular detour into the cargo zone. So, yeah, so maybe there are many detours <laughs> yeah. that we don't know about. So I was down in Augusta, Georgia recently, and I'll be talking about that in the Beer Traveler segment. But I wandered into a brewery, which, again, I will talk about later in this particular episode. And they had a games table off to the side. It was just, you know, some stuff, you know, your Connect Fours and your Cards Against Humanities and your weird one-off Carcassonne spinoff, the Ark of the Covenant that you can barely find on shelves anymore. And, you know, some other stuff. But hang on a second. What was that about a weird Carcassonne and how I'm about to play it? Because that's my life pretty much now. And yeah, Danielle, you want to tell us the the, uh, statistics on this one? I don't know. I kind of like letting you have a conversation with yourself for a while. (laughs) The Ark of the Covenant is a 2003 release from Inspiration Games. It plays two to five players in 30 minutes. It is designed by Ursula Stefan and Klaus Jörgenverda. Of course, always Klaus Jörgenverda. And the artists are Alvin Madden and Imelda Vowinkel. This is a game of tile placement, area control, and arc movement? Yeah, arc movement. So this is obviously a interesting theme of Carcassonne that I'm guessing was, if this is being 2003, that's kind of the heyday of a bunch of different Carcassonne editions. I think it's that- It's Bible Carcassonne, y'all. Yeah, but I think that was like about the time of Card Carcassonne and all the really like weird spinoffs were happening. And I'm guessing that they were just like, well, this is Carcassonne. We can turn this into this particular sub theme as well. And that's how we got the Ark of the Covenant. So all your basic Carcassonne rules are in effect, except for one or two. Uh, you have your uh, your set of meeples, you have seven meeples, and you have one large meeple, which is your prophet- Yes. Mm. And you are going to, on your turn, draw a tile, place a tile with adjoining features. You have your cities, you have your roads, and you have your fields. But there's a few things that are different. First of all, there's no farming specifically, or rather farming doesn't relate to adjacent to completed cities. Farming relates to sheep on the tiles in the fields, and you will get two points per sheep in the field that your farmer is connected to at the end of the game. There are also wolves in the field, and wolves will eat one sheep, so they're basically a minus two to one of your plus twos. That makes sense that wolves would eat sheep, and obviously there's going to be shepherds in this game. Yeah, but it kind of messes up the allegory there. (laughs) You also, in the cities, have scrolls, which are just like uh, the banners and that they give you an extra two points per scroll in that city. So not a whole lot of difference there. Uh, on, along the roads, along the roads as well, you'll see oases here and there, and they will give you an additional one point on that particular road. The other major difference is here, the profit. Like I said, you have the one profit, which is a single use meeple that you can put into a city to duplicate that particular city's score when it closes. I don't know why particularly, but that's what they've decided to make that one. And then once you've completed the first city in the game, you will place this wooden token that is the Ark of the Covenant. And it kind of looks like a depiction of the Ark of the Covenant. It's, you know, it's a box with handles that you can move around. But basically, if on your turn you choose to not place a meeple, you may move the Ark of the Covenant one to four spaces. And any other meeple that that Ark passes on its way to wherever you're going will score you a point. So it does give you something to do on a turn where you don't want to add another meeple anywhere. So for example, you're building your road to nowhere or you're making your city go wherever your city is going to go. At least you were able to get a few extra points out of this. The final weird difference in mechanics is the monasteries have been replaced by temples in this particular game. And the way it's going to work is that instead of surrounding it on all sides, you never actually get to place a meeple on a temple. When you build a temple, you're actually going to be vying for area control around the spaces and not all eight around, but just the orthogonally, you know, top, bottom, left and right spaces. Once you have placed all of those tiles to the top, bottom, left and right, any meeples that are on those tiles, well, first you'll clear out any features. So like if if, uh, placing a tile completes a road, the meeple will come off before you score that temple, which means you'll have one less person there. But you're going to score based on majority around those temples and whoever is around those temples is going to get seven points points. It's an interesting way to do that and kind of replace that monastery mechanic. And it's the kind of thing that you could easily just choose to do on your own. And it would bring a different way of attacking those rather than I drew the tile, I'm going to get these nine points eventually. I actually really did like that one mechanic a lot. That feels a little bit like the Star Wars Carcassonne where you can do a battle and how many meeples you have around a Mm -hmm. planet depends on how many dice you're going to get. Which is a weird thing for it to be like. They got rid of (laughs) monasteries and added something that's like Star Wars. You know. Yeah. Carcassonne. Carcassonne. It's a weird, weird place. 
As this is kind of an oddity in Carcassonne that, A, I don't really want to pick up because we have way too many Carcassones as it is, and B, it's not the kind of thing that I'm going to run into very frequently. Like, I saw this on the shelf and I'm just like, well, I guess I know what I'm doing tonight. This is kind of the, the hand that I've dealt for myself is that when I see a Carcassonne that I've never played, it will be played. Yeah, you definitely texted me that this was there. I was like, well... You have to play it now. Mm -hmm. So thankfully, one of the brewers there was not working at the time. She was just there for the trivia night, but she played some games before, played some Carcassonne as well. And I'm like, yo, you want to play this game? And she's like, sure. It's been sitting there for six months ever since some lady dropped it off with a bunch of other odd, weird games a, you know, a while ago that were just in her trunk. And I'm like, all right, this gets weirder and weirder, but hey, let's play some Carcassonne. So we did. And I got to say, this is... Kind of like the Star Wars Carcassonne, it brings some interesting ideas to the table that I haven't seen in other Carcassonne games. You know, I'm a big fan of the way that they dealt with the temples, with that adjacency around and that area control kind of thing being a interesting new way to handle that. I kind of liked having the, this meeple's going to double my stuff, but I don't really think that that's necessary. I think I'd rather enjoy using a big meeple for like that uh, breaking tiebreaker of control. This person's worth two people. And it also has that movement of the Ark of the Covenant, which is a Again, something you don't see very often. The Carcassonne Safari is the only one I can think of that really gave you something to do on your turn. You didn't play stuff. With the it, little jeeps. Yeah, it allows you to move those jeeps around. So all in all, like... It has interesting ideas in it. This is a one that's been out of print for a very long time. And if you're an insane completionist, I would encourage you to at least play it. I don't think anybody needs to pick it up particularly because the most interesting thing of the way that it handles the temples, you can play with any version of Carcassonne. Fair enough. I mean, I guess I'm just kind of surprised that you're so lukewarm on it because you do like base Carcassonne quite a mm -hmm. bit. And this takes base Carcassonne and sticks a couple of interesting mechanics into it without having to get expansions in it. I was expecting you to be surprisingly pleased with this, yeah. despite the fact that it's not super a theme we're into. <laughs> but I'm surprised. You seem kind of like middle of the road on this, considering we've played some clunker carcasses. Yes, yeah, we have. I don't know. Like, there are interesting ideas in this. And frankly, if we had a copy of this, I wouldn't be sad. But again, we're at the point right now where after we finish going through the whole Carcassonne, there's going to be some culling. We're going to get some of this stuff out of the house. I do promise that to you. We will get okay, rid of South say, Seas eventually. this is the eventually. first I'm hearing. Uh, probably, unless I find a way to ignore this the sentence that I've said. Nobody bring this up to me in a year being like, yo, which Carcassonne did you get rid of? Because I may be like, none of them don't tell Danielle. <laughs> I have five extra Carcassones now. Uh, but it, it's got enough interesting ideas in it. That if you have it, I think it's worth being in your collection, but I don't think it's distinct enough from base Carcassonne to warrant going after it. Um, it removes farmers and replaces it with a less powerful farmer thing. And I like farmers. I think that's a really strong feature of base Carcassonne. Mm. Additionally, one of the problems that you get is that, sure, if this is a good Carcassonne game, the biggest drawback between getting one of these spinoffs that's slightly different versus just getting base Carcassonne is that you can't add expansions to this game. If I wanted to add, say, traders and builders in, I can't do that to Ark of the Covenant. I can only do that to base. The back of the tiles in Ark of the Covenant is different, so obviously you'd know, unless you had like a, a draw bag or something, which I guess we do at this point. Danielle, don't talk me into getting Ark of the Covenant, please. I'm not talking <laughs> you into it. Aren't the like landscapes on the tiles also different? Oh, yeah. They're I mean, not grasslands, they're, are they, if they're it, oases? Yeah, it's definitely different, and you'll have that visual distinction as well. But being unable to add in expansions expansions to tailor your Carcassonne does kind of keep me away from the ones that are slightly different with some good ideas. Okay. And most of the stuff in Ark of the Covenant, like I said, you could just replicate if you wanted. Fair enough. So yeah, it's an oddity. I'm glad I had a chance to play it. Uh, thumbs up to Riverwatch Brewing for having that on their table, because when the heck else am I going to take that detour into the Carcassonne? Sounds like if this is offered up at your game table, it's not going to be a terrible experience, mm -hmm. but you don't need to go find it. That's it. All right, Danielle, moving on, we have Picoco, a 2018 release from Brain Games. This was actually a review copy from them. This plays three to five players in 30 minutes, designed by Adam Porter, with art by Renius Petersons. This is a game of trick-taking, hidden information, and shady-looking peacocks. Yeah, the peacocks are sort of individualized just in a way that makes them look <laughs> a little sketch. So Pococo is a trick-taking game, and it works a little bit like Hanabi, where you're not going to be able to see the, the cards that are in your hand, but everybody else is going to be able to see the cards that are in your hand. Well, 
the thing that makes this work is that you don't actually get points for winning tricks in this game. Everybody is going to be dealt a hand of cards of the five suits which are in the game, which correspond to the player colors. There are a few cards which have multiple colors on them, but that would be like having multiple suits on a same card. Mm -hmm. Each of the suits has a number 1 through 11, but you will remove some of those higher cards if you're playing with lower than a full player count. You are going to be looking around at all of the cards at the table with the knowledge that once a trick is started in a certain color, players need to continue in that color unless they don't have that color in their hand, which obviously is pretty standard for trick-taking games, and the highest value of the color that was led will win the hand unless somebody plays the trump suit, which is determined for each round of the game. There are three rounds in each game. The other interesting thing about this is that you're not going to be playing your cards, obviously, because you don't know what your cards are, and you wouldn't be able to tell if you were playing on (laughs) suit because you can't see them. The player to your right is going to be playing your cards, so everybody's going to be looking at the cards around, and they're going to bid with the tokens that they get at the beginning of the round, how many tricks they think each player is going to take, knowing all of the cards on the table except their own, and you don't know which ones weren't dealt out for each hand, because there will be cards that don't get dealt into everybody's hands. Everybody has nine bidding tokens for eight tricks in each round, and then after everybody else has been bid on, you're going to bid on yourself how many tricks you think you're going to take, having no knowledge of your own cards, just the knowledge of what other players have bid on you. Then people are going to take turns playing out cards from the player to their left's hand, and you're going to play out the round, taking tricks. And then at the end of each round, you're going to count up how many tricks each player has won, and then whoever bid the correct amount is going to get two points for having bid that correct amount. Any player that bid a number of tricks within one in either direction, so say Jake won two tricks and I bid that he was going to win one, and our friend Steven bid that he was going to win three, both of us would get a single point. Before you start playing out the tricks for each round, in secret, you are going to select a card which indicates which of your bids you are the most confident on. And if you guessed the exact correct number on that bid, you're going to get three additional points. However, if you did not guess correctly, you'll lose a point. There is a card there that allows you to just not pick one and you get a single point. So it's sort of the safe card. Mm -hmm. You'll add up the points everybody got from their bids and the point from that secret card that was played. That will be their score for the round. And then you will continue on to the next round. Once you've played three rounds, you will add up everybody's scores. And whoever has the most points is the winner of Pococo. And the most beautiful peacock in all the land. I don't think that's in the rules. No, but I will say the art and just color of this game is super stunning. I think that the Mm. building of those particular peacocks, you have this kind of three-dimensional peacock that holds your feather cards up and obviously when you stagger out the cards it actually does look like a fan of feathers i'm not saying it's like the best art ever i'm just thinking it's a really smart way to present this game and i thought it actually looked pretty cool on the table i mean it is certainly interesting to have these little display peacocks i am terrified every time i put my cards into mine like it's two pieces of plastic that are glued (laughs) together and you slide the cards between them and they make these little cracking noises every time you slide the cards in i'm afraid the peacocks are just going to separate and then there's no way to keep the cards upright but i guess that would be crack a few peacocks if you want to make breakfast right that's not a thing people say the euphemism no I I'm I'm meh on the art in this game. Okay. It is not bad by any stretch of the imagination. It's fine art, but because it's a game about peacocks, which are a bird that are known for being absolutely gorgeous, the sort of cartoony representations of the different peacocks like with sunglasses or side eye and a necklace or whatever are sort of meh to me. Okay. The art on the cards is fine. It's a it's a illustrated rendition of peacock feathers and they are very clear with the different colors, although I don't think yeah. there is a color representation in any way other than just to see the color. Mm-hmm. So and this is not color buying friendly. The other thing that was really interesting that we talked about a few times in terms of the coloring, like we said, some of those cards have multiple colors on them, and those are even harder to determine, specifically the fact that the yellow cards and the card that has yellow on it are different colors. In fact, the one that's They're on- orange. Yeah, it's orange on the mix card, and that's just like, is there an orange suit in here that we didn't know about? So a few little frustrating things here and there about that. As for the gameplay, this was a game that I wanted to play more for the how does this actually work kind of play rather than getting a lot of fun out of it. And I could see some groups and some families having a lot of fun with this, but 
you did some actual science in this game and you mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's what i would call science i'm yeah. not sure it's actual in, science in one of our other games you just bid even on everybody and played no confidence on yourself and you ended up actually winning that game and i'm wondering how much of that is you know the game's design itself and how much of that is just us not quite understanding the way the game would work but at the same time it's a kind of trick-taking game that I feel you would have to play a bunch of times to really get in a groove to understand what's going to take tricks and how to effectively bid and then bid on your own bids in confidence. Yeah, and that's certainly the kind of thing that trick-taking games are known for. If you routinely play trick-taking games, you are going to just naturally be better at them than True. people who don't routinely play that game. But this didn't feel like the kind of game that was going to be like a hearts or a spades, like... The, the family game that everybody plays at Christmas forever for generations and generations. Mm -hmm. I don't see like a an heirloom Pococo set going around largely because I think those peacocks would separate by then. <laughs> but it, it was certainly not immediately apparent to us when we were playing a couple of games who would win how many tricks. And I do think if you are a beginning player at this, you might be better off just sort of bidding middle of the road on everybody mm -hmm. because you'll probably be within one. There were only, I think, once or twice in a couple of games that we played that somebody won more than three tricks. Yeah. So if you bid two, you're pretty likely to get at least one point on that bid. Yeah, and more often than not, you know, you're going to hit on one of those twos because somebody else will have taken one or two more things. Like, it's, a, it's an eight-trick game, and if you're playing with four players like we were, it's pretty even there if you do bid two on everybody that every now and then you're going to hit those. Yeah, so it was interesting for what it did. It's certainly different than any other game that I could possibly think of. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a trick-taking game where you don't get to see your hand. And that's interesting. Yeah. I think I'd probably play it instead of something like Hanabi because I'm not super fond of Hanabi. Okay. But if I really needed a game where I didn't see my cards, that's a very odd situation to be in. <laughs> This, this game was fine, but I don't think it's going to come out a lot for us. Yeah, if you're a fan of trick-taking games and you're a fan of different things about trick-taking games, it's at least worth a play, right? Yeah, I mean, it it is not unenjoyable, but I think off of one play, you'll get sort of an unfulfilling experience. If you're going to dedicate five, ten plays to this to get good at it, then I think it's something you might want to give a shot. If you're going to play it once... I think you're going to have a fun time mm -hmm. just playing the cards for the other player and not knowing what's going on in front of you, but I don't feel like you're going to get a meaningful game experience. Cool. Well, that is Picoco. It is time for us to move on, maybe to a featured segment. Let's dive into the deep, deep waters of whatever the theming is in Otis. It's diving. It's diving in, in future, future, future post-apocalyptic stuff. You wouldn't know it by the box cover. Here we go. Hey, Jake, have you ever wondered what would happen if the moon, which was actually an ancient dragon god that was all riled up because warriors were trying to get rid of the gods, crashed into the Pacific Ocean and opened a rift that put humans in a post-apocalyptic state and mutated all the animals to have crazy abilities? Um, I can't say I've had exactly that thought. Well, in Tsukuyumi, you and your friends will take the role of soldiers and giant boars, a robot army, mutated roaches, and the descendants of ancient dragon slayers, each using your own abilities to bid for opportunities to accomplish your, you know, moon goals. And when can I accomplish these moon goals? Gray Fox Games is bringing Tsukiyumi to Kickstarter in mid-March 2019, so keep your eye out lest you anger the dragon moon god further. Gray Fox Games, quality games cleverly crafted. So our six-pack review this week is Otis. It is a 2017 release from Libelude and Pearl Games, which plays two to four players in 60 minutes. It is designed by Claude Lucini, with art by Paul Mefeon. This is a game of worker activation, action programming, if you can hear the air quotes, there or there, and that freaking shark, man. I love that yeah. shark. <laughs> okay, so let me think about Otis here for a second. If you look at the cover of this box, you won't really get a sense for what it is because you just kind of like see this giant uh, decaying statue and you kind of get a sense that it's underwater. And if you look really closely, you might see that there's a diver in there and there's some other, you know, little details here and there. But when you open it up and lay it out on the table, you're going to see a lot more interesting artwork. You've got a really kind of cartoony salvage operation floating on this thing on the top of, you know, on the sea, and you've got this big old underneath underwater 
apparatus <laughs> and you've got a weird shark at the top of your tower. You know, these are important things to get in your mind before we talk about Otis. <laughs> So Otis is a game of salvage and resource management where you are also, in a way, choosing which workers to use when to get other special benefits based on a central board. On your personal player board, you have a kind of a center channel. It's a two-layer player board, and in that center channel, you're going to have a stack of worker tiles. And the worker tiles, um, five of them are going to be underwater at each of the five different docks or keys that you have on your particular uh, salvage station operation. You have keys one through five, and each of them has a little cardboard tile, you're going to slide back and forth in its own left to right horizontal channel. When you slide it all the way to the right, you're going to interact with that particular worker and get some actions and some benefits based on that. There's also some of your people that are stacked up above sea level, and when you activate a worker, generally the worker is going to surface, go back to the very top of the stack, forcing you to circle through your workers. The other really interesting way that this thing operates is that when you slide one of those keys over to interact with one of your workers, that key lock is going to actually go out of commission. It's going to go underneath your board where it interacts with a track that is your quote unquote hacker who's able to hack and repair your equipment. Once you have enough key tiles down there that it touches your hacker token, your entire thing resets and then you have actions, all of those uh, actions available to you again. You also have a wild one that you can use and it'll interact with other stuff in other interesting ways, which we'll get to when we get there. So most of the workers, well, no, okay, so half of your workers are going to interact with gaining resources. There's four different resource cubes in the game. You have blue, white, green, and black. And Do they mean anything or are they just colors? Probably. Um, one of them's steel and the other one's not steel. <laughs> yep. Blue, white, green, and black. Blue, Got white, it. green, and black. And when you activate one of those workers, you're going to gain that particular resource on that level. Each level on the far right of your player board has a bay for different cubes of resources. Uh, the one at the very bottom has the most spaces, and the one at the very top only has three spaces. This is important because there are global contract cards that are available that want a specific combination of resources, either specific colors or maybe two of one thing and one of another, but you get to choose what colors it is. The contracts that are worth the most points are obviously the ones with the most resources, but only your very bottom bays are going to be able to interact with those because you can only fulfill a contract from the same uh, horizontal bay. It's even more important because then knowing that you have to activate somebody on that level four or level five to get resources in that, that means you're going to have to manipulate your divers all the way around because once you slide that person over, they surface all the way back up to the top. And if that was the resource you need, you're going to have to spend a lot of time churning your people to get back down there again. You do have a little bit of mitigation. You have battery tokens that allow you to move people up and down, and you're able to power that up. So by the end of the game, you might be able to move three or four spaces with one batteries, which makes your engine work a lot faster to fill up those resources in those lower decks and get a whole bunch of powers. But like I said, the key tokens are going to also interact with a center board, which is another really interesting kind of interactive mechanic. You have a central board, which has the score tracking. It has a kind of a shop as well, that one of your workers is able to buy or sell resources to. You have the contract cards up at the top. And then on the left, you have these five different sponsor tiles on the side of the board. And whenever you activate, say, your worker at level three and you slide your key over on level three, you're going to get whatever the level three sponsor is. Some of these are very simple. You get a credit for money or you get, you know, a battery or something like that. But some of them allow you to do other things. There's one that allows you to upgrade the worker at that particular level, turn them over to their other side, spending a little bit of a cost to make their power more powerful. There's also ones that allow you to manipulate your goods a little bit. And all of the sponsor tiles are actually double-sided, so depending on how you set up your board, it's going to change what options are available to you in those sponsor tiles. To swing back around to that wild quote-unquote X key that we talked about earlier, anytime you use that X key before you take a sponsor, you actually are going to rotate the bottom one up to the top. So that's another thing you have to think about in terms of how is this action going to change the benefit I'm going to get in this section, so on and so forth, for this worker. It's a real snowball effect of interlocking choices you're going to be making as you're playing the game. You also have a few other workers that do interesting things. One of them allows you to obviously 
upgrade your hacker or your engineer, like we talked about those side and bottom tracks. One of them allows you to trade with that central store. There's another one that's a spy that allows you to get like private objective cards that you can keep secret and cash in whenever, or copy the power of somebody on a player board, an opponent's player board that's on the same level as your spy. So you've got to also be watching who's got what in what position and all these things are all interlocking together so that every decision you make is going to impact a bunch of different things. And the game will continue until somebody gets to 18 points on the score tracker. You're going to finish out that round. And if anybody else is able to overpass that 18, then good for them. They're the best salvager and they can have the shiniest shark on top of their salvage tower. That's mm -hmm. Otis. So playing this game a few times... <laughs> I've gotten to the point where explaining it to new players is starting to get easier. You probably heard in the beginning of that that I had a hard time saying where I wanted to start, but once you get going and thinking about the way the game works, every time I think about a piece of the game, it immediately shoots me over to another piece. I'm like, oh, I gotta explain this thing next, or I gotta talk about how this is gonna impact this. And that's kind of the way the learning curve has felt for me as I've played the game and gotten to learn it more, is that each time I play this, I feel myself scaling that curve a little bit faster. It's certainly easier if you've got the pieces in front of you as well. Mm -hmm. Listening to this, I would not be surprised if some people are like, I'm sorry, you do what to who now? <laughs> Who's got the sharks? But when you have all the pieces in front of you, it actually makes a whole lot of sense. You know, if I'm moving the door at level three, I'm going to use the diver at level three, and I see that that's right next to the door, and I'm actually pushing it with mm -hmm. the sliding tile. Any resources that I get are going to go at the bay next to the diver, which is right adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look at the tile that's in that same section. So it, it really does make sense when you see it in front of you, but it is sort of very difficult to explain. Mm -hmm. And this is a game that had been on my radar for a while. This came out two years ago. And it was one of these games that didn't seem to get talked about a whole lot. Like, I'd see it on the shelf, and I'd look at the cover and be like, eh, okay. I'd look at the back, and I'm like, oh, that's kind of a neat player board. But it nobody nobody seemed to have a copy. Nobody really wanted to you know play it. Nobody was excited about it. And I actually picked it up on the Geekway trading table last year at Geekway to the West, Uh we traded out, you know, some of our games and picked up some other stuff. We got this one and I think Civilization and something else. I don't remember what. It was. Oh, Clank in Space. But Otis was one that was just like, well, I mean, I guess I'll pick this up. I have no idea what it is, but, you know, it seems like a game that I'm interested in. And it just kind of sat there on the shelf and didn't do anything. And at Whose Turn Is It Anyway, earlier this year, I had a chance to play this with Ruth from the Five By podcast. Mm -hmm. She is apparently a big fan of this game. And I was like, oh, you know, I would actually like to learn how to play that because I haven't had a chance to play that yet. And we sat down with a few other players and played through this thing. I was like, oh, dang. Oh, these are really, really interesting systems. I don't have any idea what I'm doing right now, but this is a really cool set of interlocking stuff. So when we got back, you know, I'm like trying to get it out. And I think it honestly took us a few weeks to get this thing to the table even after that, just because it's, oh, we got to learn this whole, you know, set of stuff. But I am super enjoying this game after playing it a few times. Yeah. I mean, we were under a bunch of stuff that needed to get reviewed for mm -hmm. previous episodes. But also, I didn't get a chance to play this with you, so it was on you to teach me the entire game. <laughs> this You guys played this while I was waiting to get Gen Con housing, so oh, I was yeah. in the middle of freaking out to that and wasn't paying any attention to the rules. All I saw was you had this really neat-looking game on the table with these cool double-layer player mats, and you're sliding this across and moving the divers and cycling the divers. It looked really interesting to watch, even if I had no retention of what y'all were doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that the look of it on the table is what's going to initially draw people to this. Like we said, these player boards are really cool. I will say we've had some problems with warping, which is kind of just a general thing you see with dual layer player boards. You know, they're pretty warped, bent up a little bit so that some of the stuff on the underneath doesn't slide as well as I want it to. No, I, can obviously... I don't really have that problem. Oh, okay, good. Well, the red one has got some bend in it. Mm. And I'm frustrated in a way that the art design of the boards and the center board that's got a lot of cool, you know, post-apocalyptic, like cyberpunk, water world kind of aesthetic to it with some characters that are like super fun and colorful. The robot, like, for example, is this bright yellow robot that's got like a circle like emoji Wally. face, kind of like, yeah, like a Wally robot or something like that. And yeah, there's some colorful characters there. And then you look at the box cover and it's just like, this is dark underwater Greek statue thing. And it's like, 
I don't understand what you're doing here. You could have marketed this game a heck of a lot better. They should have put that shark dude on the cover. Should have just had just the shark and just tiny letters. I guess this is Otis, y'all, but shark. That would be the name of the game. I mean, why is this game even called Otis? Um, Can I have a rain check on that? Hold on. Let me use the magic of editing to find out. Well, apparently you are on the Otis colony and you are salvaging. Yeah, Otis colony. That... Like, okay, I get it now, but the name Otis, O-T-Y-S, doesn't bring underwater exploration to mind for me, per, for example. You know, like, you could call it Nautilus Colony? Would have made a little sense, maybe? I don't know. I'm sure that there is a very good reason, and I'm splitting hairs on this, but it is kind of weird to see the box cover with this name, and it looks like something, and then you get in there, and it's a completely different game, in my opinion. Yeah, I don't feel like it's splitting hairs. If your name doesn't come across what the game is about and the box cover isn't real clear on what the game is about, mm-hmm. then you're relying essentially on word of mouth, which I don't remember hearing a whole ton about this, unfortunately. Yeah, I think that's really the the catch of this particular thing is that, like I said, nobody was talking about this game. It took me a year after we got it off of Geekway to basically learn it and then play it because it been nobody talked about the darn thing. So let's so, talk about the darn thing. Yeah. So, Danielle, how did you feel you developed playing this game a few times? I certainly got a better feeling for how everything was interacting and how I needed to make sure everything was interacting in order to be competitive in this game with a couple of plays. Mm -hmm. In my first game, I was like, okay, how do I even get resources on the same level? How do I make sure that I'm not out of the door that I need when I need to use it so that somebody else takes that contract ahead of me? How do I make a basic go for some points? <laughs> and then by the second or third game that we're playing this, I was like, okay, it's not necessarily about how do I not have any resource or not have no resources left. It's about how can I get resources in the strategic spots so that when my divers cycle, I get the most mm. benefit out of their sponsorship tiles. And also I'm setting myself up for not having to waste battery tokens to move divers into place. How am I making sure that I have credits and battery tokens when I want them? Mm. Can I sell this now to make sure that I get the most money for it? And another player can't sell what they have that's not useful to them to get the most money for it. It definitely clicked a lot on second and third games. Mm -hmm. But even in that first game where I was struggling to have resources to do stuff, I was having a good time because you never feel like you're not doing anything in this game. Yeah, something must have definitely clicked because in our final two-player of this game, you walloped me. (laughs) Sometimes one must. Yes, it was well-deserved because I had done well in a previous game. I really... I'm enamored with the way that pieces work together in this game. You know, it's the thing that I talk about when we were talking about Freshwater Fly. I love games that have interlocking pieces. I love seeing that kind of stuff happen. I feel like to, again, borrow this phrase from the Dukes of Dice, there was a number of times that it made me feel super clever when I said, oh, I can spend this battery here to move this diver here and then spend my X to cycle all of the sponsors to slide that over, get this thing to do this thing to do this thing. And you pull off these huge major turns that feel super great. I expect that if I continue playing this game more and more, I'll have more of those turns and fewer turns where I'm just like, I guess I'm going to get a blue this turn. Oh, and I don't get to use the sponsor action, or I'm just going to do this to get the one credit for sponsor action. But in any kind of optimization game like this, you're going to have those turns that feel not so useful. Yeah, but at the same time, even turns that don't feel super useful in and of themselves, you're usually taking to set yourself up for a big turn on Mm -hmm. a future turn. If you're not, then you're not going to win the game. But like, Even in the last games we were playing, there were times when I'm like, I'm going to open door four, not use the sponsor action, take the green thing and cycle it. (laughs) But that set me up to get two or three resources on the next turn based on sponsor actions or based on using X tiles that allowed me to sort of bypass the fact that I had Mm. already used a door. Maybe I was using an upgrade to make sure that on a future turn I could use a battery to move somebody from like the first row all the way down to the fourth row. It definitely was in service of a better turn later on. And you needed to know what that was when you were taking the sort of 
boring turn. Mm -hmm. So you had a, a vision of why you were doing this, and it didn't feel as boring because you already had the plan in your head. And I, I guess it's really up to you to choose how you want to attack your objectives in this particular game. I generally will go after upgrading my battery track really early so that those batteries allow me for, to have bigger movement. And I don't mind so much about the hacker track at the bottom because if I'm able to move my workers more, I'm able to use whatever locks are available or keys are still available more frequently. How did you feel about those two tracks? Did you ever really go on the inverse of that? Yeah, entirely. I would make sure that my hacker track was upgraded before I even started looking at my battery track, unless I had a specific action that I had in mind where I could use the upgrade worker to increase my battery to then do something immediately. Oh, okay. It was the later thing that I was checking because I liked the ability to cycle through and have more choice Mm -hmm. for moving that hacker track, which unlocks the doors a little bit quicker. I think it also depends on which of the sponsor tiles are out because that combination changes every game. You have a bunch of dual-sided tiles, so you're not going to have the same combination of potential powers, and depending on what the combination of powers is, it may be more or less valuable to upgrade one or the other track. I also found myself very rarely using the market. There's the little market thing where you can basically pay by how much demand there is for a resource to the central market to either buy or sell. If it it has three spaces, if it's empty, you get the most coins for it, but you can't buy it. If it's full, you can't buy it, but, you know, well, I guess you can't sell it either, but you can buy it for the cheapest. There we go. So, you know, I didn't never found myself using that a whole lot. And I think it was honestly because I never had a whole bunch of extra credits to buy resources. Mm-hmm. But it's nice to have that in there just to have you that give you that one extra option to move some cubes around if you need it. Yeah. And if you have the upgraded trader action, which is the woman who allows you to buy and sell from the market, then you can get additional points or credits when you do buy or sell hmm. so that you don't need to do it all the time. But when you do it, it is more powerful. And getting... I mean, if you're selling a resource that there are none in the market, getting three credits is at least two actions worth of credits that you're Mm, doing. Good point. That can really swing you three credits worth of action. Maybe I should probably start using that more. The other thing we often talk about in a contract fulfillment game is the, the Manhattan Project problem. I never feel in Otis like the contract scores are so far apart that if you miss one kind of round of when everybody's finishing their first contract, you got set too far behind. I think they're between, what, one and five points? Correct. And for a total of 18 points, obviously, somebody could get four cards of value five and finish it out. But I feel like it takes so much longer to build one of those high-level contracts that it really balances out well, and you don't get stuck with that Manhattan Project problem. Well, also, you can't be working on multiple high-level contracts at the same time because you only have one or two what is it one or two bays and a five at the bottom okay so yeah there's only two bays that can be really working on those four or five point contracts Mm -hmm. because that's how many resources they require on the same row you can have five different low level contracts working at the same time if you wanted if you had gotten a bunch of extra cards from that spy because you do have some secret objectives that only you know you're working on you could be working on a couple of different smaller objectives But if you're working on the big ones, you kind of have to work on them one or two at a time, and that's it. The other thing is there were smaller ways to get points here. Mm. There are some of the tokens which are next to the sponsor tiles that you can either take by using the robot worker or, depending on what the sponsor tiles are, sometimes you can use them just by using a sponsor tile. Those have points on them. And if you take one with the robot worker, it stays on the level that it was used at, And maybe you'll get an extra point when you fulfill a contract at that level. You also get points when you upgrade workers or use specific sponsor tiles. So it doesn't have that problem where you only score when you finish a thing and that is the only way to get points and there's no other way to catch up. Mm -hmm. You could, I mean, you could even sell a resource that doesn't have any resource or Honestly, if you have your upgraded trader, you could sell a resource that does have a couple of it in the market and still get a point or two because you get an extra point. And there are some that are zero points, so an extra point there is one. Points are good. You can always get little bits of points in this game as opposed to a lot of games where you're just – you either are done or you're not. Hmm. Okay. So scaling in this game is going to come along with another discussion that we've honestly talked about a lot 
preparing for this episode. At two players, the game does honestly play in, what, 45 minutes, I think is what we did that one? Maybe. In a higher player count game, it's going to be determined on the downtime that each player takes. Because stuff can change before your turn, you can't 100% plan your turn before you go, meaning that a four-player game could easily get up into that hour and a half range. And I I wonder your opinions on, is the downtime manageable or is the downtime okay in this game? I don't really feel like it was unmanageable. Okay. Because you do need to have a plan for what you intended to do, Mm -hmm. you should never be planning your whole turn when you get to your turn. The only time it's going to be severely disrupted is if you are relying on a sponsor tile and somebody uses a wild door Mm -hmm. because that shuffles the sponsor tokens before their turn or if you're playing in a high player account if a couple of people used a wild door but if at least one person did you should know that you need to start replanning so if only one person used a wild door then yeah you need to refigure your turn Hmm. or maybe if somebody takes the contract you are working on but at that point at least you should have some fairly stored up resources and there's always the chance to take additional contract cards that you can maybe even luck into. Yeah. It never felt like somebody was like really hemming and hawing over their turn for more than a minute or two in this game. Like there are games where you get gridlock when it gets to your turn. And you're like, I have no idea what I was going to do mm-hmm. because this is a completely different board state than I was anticipating, or this is a completely different board state than it was when I set myself up in Otis. It is occasionally different than you would expect it to be. But it it is not so wildly different that I feel like you can't do anything with your turn. Yeah, and this is the discussion that I felt like we 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 had the most with our game group is that I felt like there was downtime, but it never felt like downtime because of what you just said. You're still aware that you have to be thinking about your turn and have that plan B just in case. And I do really appreciate that. It's hard to find games with this many interlocking pieces that afford you that a little bit of flexibility. You do get your mitigation, obviously, with your rant, your wild doors and your batteries and stuff like that. And the contracts, being able to have your own secret ones and also that they're refreshing if somebody does buy it, does give you more ways out. It's not like somebody's going to take your only thing and you're just like, well, crap, I guess I'm selling these resources. The other thing about the contracts is that a bunch of them are just one of three different resources or two of one resource and three of another. Mm -hmm. So if you were working on a specific high level contract card and that one card gets taken, you can probably waylay those resources into a different contract card that isn't specific on the color of the resources, just whether they are the same or different, Mm -hmm. which is not how you build things, by the way. (laughs) You're never like, I need three of something and two of another. Could be glass and steel, could be green and black (laughs) well i mean if all the cubes are the same it really just comes down to the colors huh (laughs) so how do you feel like the staying power of this game is going to be now that we've learned it and played it do you like i'm wanting to get this out again every now and then i don't know if it offers enough variability for me to want to bring it back a whole ton though it's sort of a weird question because i know we don't bring games back all the time even when we want to bring them back all Mm -hmm. the time so i feel like every time that it is feasible that this game would come back i would probably play it yeah it's the kind of game that sticks in my mind enough it's different enough it feels different enough when i put it out on the table and when i'm playing it that I would probably want to play it every couple of months or so, which for us is really as frequently as we're getting anything to the table, really. I think a lot of keeping this game around in our playgroup is going to depend on you or I or somebody else who's already played it bringing it up as an option. Because like I said at the very beginning of the discussion, I don't expect people to pick this up looking at the box. And I think that that's going to be the thing that will hurt it long term is that if that box was more attractive and sold what was going on more, you know, it had, you know, some kind of depiction of the fact there's a lot of different things that are interlocking in this game, or you get to play with these cool workers that do a bunch of fun stuff. People might be more ready to pick it up. And it's going to rely on people like us who have played the game to talk about this and be like, yo, this is going to be a fun thing that we can do in, you know, 60 to 90 minutes. Right. But once you get it out of the box and put it on the table, Mm -hmm. I feel like it immediately has that power. True. Like this hits the part of my brain that I assume people who like minis games get, like, poked at when they see really cool minis. Yeah. 
Like that little channel of workers and the workers, the, the doors slide over and the workers cycle up. <laughs> that hits the part of my brain that's like, oh, this is so cool on the table. I want to do it again. And there's a neat interlocking system. Once it's on the table, I am jazzed to play this game. It's just a matter of getting it on the table, which, I mean, you can't really fault the game for the fact that the cover is not great. All right. Well, final thoughts. I feel like there's a metaphor in what you just said is that you can't judge a game by its cover 100% of the time. And frankly, Otis has a lot of really awesome interlocking pieces and pretty darn good production that allows you to have fun with the pieces and really think about the way that stuff works together. I found it a pretty easy to understand once you get a round or two in, but those first few rounds is going to require somebody who's played it to really show you the way that it's going to work together. Otherwise, you might have a tale that's just a, a metaphor for a fish out of water. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to stick with that. Sure. I mean, there's nothing about Otis that is overly complicated, and I think that's what I like about it. You do need to make sure that you're lo looking at all the parts that are going to be affected when you take a turn. But it is not a brain-burning game to me. There are a lot of things to consider, but when you find something that is a good way forward, it's fairly easy to work with that. Hmm. And that's, a, in addition to the fact that I absolutely love the way that it looks on the table, like, that's the thing that I like about it. I get to feel like I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff and I'm making stuff work together without feeling like I need to sit there for 15 minutes on my turn and like arduously debate over what I'm going to do on this turn. It is simple, but it's got a lot of interconnected parts. And that's what I like about it. That That is a very good wheelhouse for me. So if you're looking for something like that, it's it's fun to look at and it's got lots of cool things that all work together. And when you push the ball down the Rube Goldberg machine, it does like 15 different things. This is the kind of game for you. All right. Well, that is our review of Otis, O-T-Y-S. But we're not quite done with you yet, Otis. Sit down, because we've got some beers to pair with you. Uh, became strangely authoritative in this no, last few stop seconds. stop giving here. Otis a stern talking to. Otis, we'll be right back. For more information on the beers we chose to pair with today's game on tap, check out the show notes section at our website, draftmechanic.net. All right, we've got some beer salvage-worthy pairings for Otis, the 2017 release from Libelud and Pearl Games, two to four players, 60 minutes, designed by Claude Luchini, with art by Paul Mafayan. This is a game of worker activation, action programming, and contract fulfillment, and also a shark. Good or shark. four, depending on player count. <laughs> the first beer we have is from Brokreacza in Krakow, Poland. This is Deep Dark Sea Imperial Baltic Porter. It's a 10.1% ABV, 50 IBU Baltic Porter, which is aged for over six months to propagate flavors of chocolate, wholemeal bread, and dark fruits. It is bottled, and they also have a bottled bourbon barrel-aged version, so Ooh. if you are looking for something even more deep and dark, you can get the <laughs> barrel-aged version, or the bourbon barrel-aged version. Up next, from Kindred Brewing in Gahana, Ohio, we have Salvage Porter. Clocks in at 5.8% ABV, and this is their base porter that they do tons of variants on. There's a coffee and a toasted coconut. Those ones are canned, but they have done literally dozens of small batch variants. Uh, remember how we just talked about small batch variants episode? Uh, was that last episode? Or the I one believe before? it was. There it was. Danielle, you did the, the research on this. Do you remember any of the other oddities that they did? I mean, they had a cinnamon. They had a mm. they, they had a vanilla. They had a cinnamon vanilla. They oh. had a cinnamon vanilla fig, I want to say. <laughs> oh, whoa, that's They had cool. a cherry. They had, like, they had literally dozens of them. That's, Dang. That's why I wrote that. All right. If you were somewhere around Kindred Brewing, let us know the craziest one of this that you've had. I will tell you they are this week's winner for prettiest but most useless website <laughs> so don't go on their website expecting to find anything about the variants of this beer or this beer at all or their beer at all you'll just get some pictures of their taproom <laughs> next up from verdant brewing company in falmouth cornwall england we have even sharks need water <laughs> this is the new england ipa of this on tap the one non-dark beer that i've managed to get onto this list and it is 6.5 percent abv it is a New England IPA brewed with Simcoe Citra and Galaxy Hops with a fruity house yeast strain to get a tropical aroma, but also a sharp citrus flavor and a little bit of bitterness in there. Hmm. This is available in 16-ounce cans. 
From Van de Streek Beer in Utrecht, Netherlands, we have Deep Dive. It's an Imperial Stout at 13% ABV, ooh boy, and 130 IBU. This is an Imperial Stout aged in Austin Toschen whiskey barrels, and it is bottled. Those are the facts that I have for you. <laughs> and finally, I kind of twisted the, the <laughs> rules on this last one. If you are listening to this, when I say that the next beer is Vanilla Otis from Ninkasi Brewing Company in Eugene, Oregon, that sounds like it goes perfectly with Otis the game, except it's spelled differently. But whatever. You know what? I wanted to get you a nice, widely distributed, year-round available U.S.-made beer because there were a lot of... Uh, frankly, there were a lot of stuff that is rotating winter seasonals on this list because mm. that's when you make dark beers. That's when you make it the porters. So again, like I said, Ninkansi Brewing Company, Eugene, Oregon, Vanilla Otis Oatmeal Stout, which is 7% ABV and 50 IBU. Unsurprisingly, it's an oatmeal stout brewed with whole vanilla beans. It's available year-round in 22-ounce bottles, even though their website has a picture of it in 12-ounce bottles. They say it's available in 22s, and that's what I've been seeing. Mm. It is tasty, and I would suggest... Picking up one next time you decide that you're going to play Otis. Yes. I brought a bottle of this back when I did my West Coast trip a long time ago. It is good. Mm -hmm. <sighs> well, for more information on, on all of those beers, of course, the show notes section at the website draftmechanic.net is where you will find all of the required information that you seek. So up next, Danielle, I'm going to borrow the beer segment. Is that cool? No, go ahead. Okay. So when we were talking about Ark of the Covenant a little while ago, I mentioned that I had played this at a brewery, Riverwatch Brewing in Augusta, Georgia. So I actually wanted to put together a little beer traveler segment for Augusta, Georgia. We've always kind of like saved these for like the big crazy cities and have a whole bunch of stuff. And we end up leaving out like 75% of breweries you probably needed to check out. And probably three new breweries opened up between us recording and it releasing. So you suggested that we start bringing these beer traveler segments in when we get to go to these smaller places so that if people are traveling through, they have ideas of where they can stop on the interstate. And, you know, if they're going to Augusta for the Masters in a few weeks, you know, here's some good options for you for craft beer. So I spent the last week in Augusta for work and had a chance to visit all of the awesomest spots that there are. So here we go. Uh, the first one that I talked about a little while ago was Riverwatch Brewery. You can get to them at riverwatchbrewery.com. They are open Wednesday through Saturday till 9 p.m. Uh, they open at like, I don't know, 4 o'clock o'clock during the week and then one o'clock on Saturday. It's a really comfy space with just a few tables, a bar, and a nice patio outside. They got a few bar snacks. When I wandered in there on, I think it was Wednesday night, they actually were doing a trivia night that was just kind of wrapping up when I showed up and just, you know, fun little trivia. It was super chill, super welcoming and inviting atmosphere and experience and there is some classic collection of pale ales blondes reds and lagers on there i had a really nice pale ale called the 104 pale ale that was just your very classic american style pale ale kind of that americanized uh ESB flavor with a good, you know, good little hop profile to it, a nice little bit of hops. But they did have some fun and interesting stuff on tap, and it looks like they are continually putting out new and interesting things. The first one that I tried was a barrel-aged sour red called Wild Irish Rose. It had a really nice sour funk to it, and I'm guessing this is based off of their regular red that they do, but they did this fun one for St. Patrick's Day and released it around then. They had a vanilla and cinnamon brown called Murphy's Law that mm. had a, a really nice both of those kind of spiced flavor to it. Uh, and the one that I was most excited about that I went actually went back the next night for and brought a crowler back home that you can enjoy later is the Godfather of Stout, which is their Imperial Stout with habanero peppers. Mm. It actually had a nice burn on it. It wasn't as much of a burn as we get from like Asheville Brewing's Fire Escape, but it definitely has more actual heat than maybe Jalapeno Pale Ale from Birdsong. Uh, you get a lot of that back of the throat kind of tingle on that. So I would super encourage you to check out Riverwatch. They do some packaging as well. And you can play Ark of the Covenant there. <laughs> yeah, if you want to, you can play Ark of the Covenant. Uh, but one of the things that I loved so much about this, in addition to that really welcoming vibe, the staff and the people that were actually in that tap room, super nice people. You know, I said I played with one of the brewers. We played Ark of the Covenant and the bartender there as well. And one of the patrons, we ended up talking about board games for a good like half hour or so at the end of the night, closing down the bar. It was really awesome to see that kind of community there in a place that I didn't expect it from. The other brewery that you have in town is Savannah River Brewing Company. This is savannahriverbrew.com. They're open Wednesday through Friday evenings and then Saturday and Sunday till uh, 10 or 9 p.m., depending on the day. You can obviously see their website 
uh, for all that info. Larger industrial style kind of like hangar looking space. They mm-hmm. got a, some TVs around and they've got a projector for putting up like the big game or whatever. And they also do some small plate snacks. You've got some pretzels. You've got like some deli meat charcuterie trays that aren't really like fancy charcuterie. But, you know, you get some salami and some cheese, stuff like that. They do a lot of classic American styles. You get your IPAs, your Ambers, your Belgian Wits. Those kind of thing. Belgian Wits, the classic American style. Yeah, well, I mean, it really like has become. No, in I a get way, what you mean. I'm just... You expect to see it at a lot of American breweries, and it's actually kind of interesting. Their wit beer was one of the big standouts for me. It was a. It's called Witty Belgian. This one is Origin Coriander with a tiny bit of black peppercorn in there, and it just had a really awesome, crisp, and kind of floral aroma and mouthfeel to it, uh, which. You can really often get a lot of wet beers that are just nothing but orange, nothing but citrus. But I really did get a lot of those other tones on this to make it a nice herbal kind of wit beer. Ooh. So that was super awesome. They had another one that was a Berliner Weisse with blackberries and guava called Fizzini's... F- fin- fin- it's a swamp thing. It's named fin- after... Is swamp thing? Fin- fin- okay, fine. You did much better at it. Like usual, you're good at pronounces. I had more time to read while you were talking. <laughs> so the Finnessy Swamp thing is a Berliner Weisse with blackberries and guava. It did have a really nice fruity tart to it. They also had a few other ones there. They had a You Know Nothing John Stout, which was their stout. And they also had a nitro version of it. And I think it had cherry. It was, yeah, it was a cherry stout. And it was re- honestly less noticeable on the nitro. I didn't get as much flavor off the nitro version, which That's I'm pretty standard. really just, you know, the carbonation is going to change the way that you taste that beer. But I really enjoyed their space. And they apparently have food trucks as well. Um, oh, one thing I should say, both Riverwatch and Savannah River package. Uh, Riverwatch does bottles of a lot of stuff, including some large format bottles, like for that Wild Irish Rose. And Savannah River does cans on a lot of stuff. I'm going to call it right now. Mm-hmm. I think guava is the next big trend in like tropical beer flavors. Okay. We've seen like Salud Cerveceria has a guava beer recently. You are talking about this guava Berliner Weiss. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to call it like for a while we saw pineapple in a lot of things and then we saw passion fruit in like everything. I'm going to call guava is the next big thing. Okay. Well, we will see shortly, and maybe you'll do a beer segment on guava someday. This is going to be like, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> I also had a chance to go to two restaurants that focused on craft beer. The first one is called The Hive. Uh, you can go to their website, hiveaugusta.com, and this restaurant has 78 taps. Uh, there's a selection of wine, kombucha, craft sodas, and cocktails on tap, and then 61 of those taps are just for craft beer. They had a really wide selection from all over the area. In fact, they had something from D9 up in Huntersville, which is, you know, just uh, up, quote-unquote, up the block from us here in Charlotte. There was a good selection of a bunch of different stuff. They had some bearded iris. I had a chance to get home style. There was a bunch of local Georgia stuff as well. You could find a lot of Atlanta-based and a lot of, you know, that kind of stuff in the area, too. Well, the one thing that's sort of surprising about that is you had been mentioning to me that because of the way the laws work in Georgia, the fact that they had stuff from around by us mm-hmm. was surprising and and exciting because the, they don't always have 100% control of what they can get a hold of down there. Yeah, distribution is weird. And I heard a lot about that when I went to the other place we're talking about here, too. But uh, just being able to find great beer bars in kind of an odd market in Georgia was really awesome. The other really interesting thing about the Hive is they use a system called Digital Pour for managing their kegs, you can actually go onto the Digital Pour app and onto the Hive's website and check the current tap list, but not just that, but the pour sizes, the pricing, when the keg went on, and the current status of how full the keg is. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, we've I've seen this uh, here and there in like Indianapolis. Somebody had it when I was walking around there at one point, but... It's a really awesome system that doesn't seem to get a lot of use. There's like in the Charlotte metro area, one place in Rock Hill is the only place around here that uses it. I'm, I'm going sure, to Rock Hill. <laughs> I'm sure that there is a lot of up, you know, upfront costs in this and a lot of upkeep involved oh, in the certainly. system. But having this system was really awesome because I was able to, before going over there, I'd be like, oh, okay, I actually want to get that particular beer first because the keg is low and it's something I'm not going to be able to find. So having that kind of access is something super awesome and super worth looking into if you're coming through that area. That's like a turbocharged version of the untapped menus Mm -hmm. function that I absolutely adore and wish more craft beer bars or breweries would use. Mm -hmm. But this seems like an even more fancy and telling version of that because it tells you the percentage of the keg that's there and 
the different kinds of uh, pours that you can have available. They also had some really good food specials. They had a wing night on Monday, a taco Tuesday night. They had burgers on Wednesday, and they had a really knowledgeable staff. I will confess that I went there two nights in a row for wings and then tacos, and they were both really good. And I did not make it to the burger place because I went to the next place that we're going to talk about instead. Uh, on Wednesday is when the brewery's open, so I got to hit up River Watch, and the crew there suggested that I go over to Arsenal Tap Room, which is another really well reputed craft beer uh, restaurant in town. There, their website is arsenaltaproom.com if you want it. This is a restaurant with about twenty or thirty taps that reminded me vaguely of the Porter Beer Bar in Atlanta, mm-hmm. in that it's kind of a you know a pub kind of style, English pub kind of style, with a really eclectic tap selection. It's a smaller selection than something like the Hive, but much more exciting offerings. What obviously drew me in is the fact that they had four different beers from Burial on tap. Uh, what Never a heard of them. Yeah, no. But let's not even pretend. I talk about Burial any chance I get. But they had four of them on uh, and one very specific Burial beer glass. It's my very favorite beer glass. They had one left over from whenever they got them a few years ago. Because obviously <laughs> glasses get broke. But their can and bottle selection also had some really odd stuff that I didn't expect to find. They had beer from Hubbard's Cave and uh, Unane in Chicago. Some of their weirder stouts like the coffee and cakes or the, uh, what is it, the pancakes one is another one. And then some of the sours from Unane. And then some of the fresh hop beers from uh, Hubbard from Hubbard's Cave. And that was really freaking fantastic beer, by the way. But they had an awesome atmosphere as well. And the bartender there was super chill. Uh, it was late at night. So we just got to talk about beer and how, you know, beer distribution works in Georgia. And that's, you know, who was telling me about how they don't always get control over beer that's sent into Georgia. Even if it is specifically sent for a bar, the distributor really has the choice of where stuff goes. And that's kind of a bummer to hear, but hopefully they can get those laws changed. They got the ability to have, you know, public tap rooms in Georgia finally without having to go through the tour rigmarole. And here in North Carolina, we're finally being able to self-distribute over 25K. So times are changing. And I was super excited to find some awesome beer locations in Augusta, Georgia. Awesome. Thank you for telling us about them. I can't imagine that I'm going to be in Augusta very frequently (laughs) because I don't have a work reason to be there, but I'm sure that there is somebody who's listening to this who's going to be headed through. So maybe you've helped them out. Mm -hmm. And I will say before I wrap this up, I had a surprisingly awesome time in Augusta overall. And a lot of that is due to the board game community I found there. Like really weird coincidence, maybe like three, four days before I headed down there, I got talking with somebody on Instagram who I thought was in North Carolina somewhere, but was just from Boone originally, and now actually lived in Augusta, Georgia. So uh, big shout out to Chris. You can follow him on Instagram. It's at wards.and.boards. So W-A-R-D-S and boards with dots in between on Instagram. Uh, He invited me into his house. We played a game of Scythe with him and some friends. We played two games of Downforce. We talked about games, and it was just a super awesome time. So super thanks to you Chris for inviting me into your home after just talking to us on Instagram and being like yeah you're a gamer we can hang out Uh, (laughs) that was super (laughs) awesome I also got to go to Cardboard Castle Games which is kind of like a magic style you know Magic Den a lot of Friday Night Magic stuff going on which is there in Augusta but they did have a nice little selection of board games as well and it's not just like the obligatory board games but they had some one-off stuff and some new stuff as well I think they had Fireball Island was in there the new Roll for the Galaxy expansion was in there and I was really surprised to see that because that just came out. I did not spend $80 on an expansion. Don't worry. Thank you. (laughs) But uh, it's cool to see the board game community growing and thriving in places like this that I wouldn't have expected it. So if you are going through Augusta, stop into some of these breweries or some of these restaurants or, you know, at least wave at, you know, Chris's Instagram as you're driving by because there's a lot of cool gaming going on down there. So I'm pretty dang happy I got a chance to spend a week in Augusta. Well, awesome. If there is anywhere you happen to know of in Augusta, Georgia that we left out, feel free to leave it in the thread on our Board Game Geek Guild or shoot us a message on Twitter or Instagram or something, Mm -hmm. and we will certainly add it to the show notes. Well, speaking of people who have gone places, this is a perfect segue, friend of the show, Will Foy, actually went to Unpub up in Maryland uh, last weekend, and we have him on the show after the break to talk about his experience playing a whole bunch of Unpub games. Okay, 
Okay, so as a final round this episode, instead of just reading responses from our Slack channel, not that we don't love to read responses from our Slack channel, we figured that we would check in with a person who is not only in our Slack channel, but has come to a bunch of our local game groups and is a friend of ours, who is sort of an aficionado on going to uh, the Unpub events, and was recently at the Unpub Con, the big Unpub Con of the year, they do many events as well, up in, I believe, Maryland, right, Well. That is correct. It's in Hunt Valley, Maryland. So we have Will Foy, who's going to tell us a little bit about his experiences at Unpub this year. Hello, Draft Mechanicers. Uh, Yes, so Unpub is a board game conference in Hunt Valley, Maryland, where every game at the con has not been published yet. Uh, They may be heading towards a publishing event, uh, working with directly with a publisher going straight to market, or they might be working towards going to Kickstarter or other crowdfunding. But the idea is that game designers pay to be there so that you can give feedback freely to make their game more fun, better, more interesting, uh, more worthy of hitting your and your friends' tables. So that's Unpub. And you've been going for a few years, right? So I've been going to Unpub-style events uh, at several cons, but the Unpub Prime, that I'll call it, uh, I actually went last year for the first time loved it and planned immediately to go back even though it was the same week as my wedding anniversary Shh, mm. don't tell my wife <laughs> um although she was gone on her anniversary different problem anyway uh <laughs> and it just so happens that since we're moving to that area it makes it way easier to go to next year's con which cool. they've already announced dates for it's actually going to be memorial day weekend i believe or the mm. weekend before i need to double check the calendar but um that's going to be in may they're moving the con uh for reasons hmm. okay had you done any of the Unpub mini events? Because I know they did a couple that were up in Durham. They, there was one at Atomic Empire I had gone to. Had you done any of the local ones? I had not done the local ones. There is an Unpub room at Gen Con and a few other conferences. They're mm-hmm. fairly small. Um, I just think it's super brilliant that uh, – I guess part of the shtick is this is playtesting, right? The whole point of this is let's give – feedback make them make a more fun game and we're not really talking about the art in fact in most cases these games have nothing near uh final art Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the games i'll talk about the designer had been working on it for six weeks what we played at unpub was six weeks old wow and it's super impressive that uh people can make something that's a really fun very well fleshed out game and such a small amount of time and then just continue to iterate. This is one of those, do you write great first drafts and then edit the heck out of it? Or do you uh, take a really long time to write your first draft of a game and then, you know, edit a couple of times. I I think a lot of this shows the former is a really great way to prototype, get something to table, Mm -hmm. get feedback, create that feedback loop and make more fun stuff. So you had a chance to see a whole bunch of stuff and a bunch of different levels of finish here. About how many games did you get to kind of dig into over your time at Unpub? I would say I probably got to around, I either played or watched probably a couple of dozen games. Mm -hmm. Were there way more on the floor? Yes. Do I feel guilty for missing some of my favorite designers? (laughs) Yes. Um, In fact, T.C. Petty uh, invited me to play Ez with him, which is a design he's working on now. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, I had to turned down <laughs> Aww, bummer. So, i'm sorry tc uh, <laughs> anyway uh i had a i had a young lady with me and that's one of the cool things too is uh, i was thinking ahead of the con what do i want to target what do i want to play i ended up specifically uh, trying to pay more attention to playing uh games designed by women and persons of color just to get a different experience um mm-hmm. provide feedback because i think their games are just as worthy of feedback as anybody else's. Um, and in fact, as we saw last year, Elizabeth Hargrave made a breakout hit mm-hmm. uh, of Wingspan. She actually had two games at the con. Uh, one I've, uh, actually two I will talk about as kind of honorable mentions. Uh, one is To Tame a Fox, which mm-hmm. is a fox experimentation uh, worker placement game. And uh, the other is Stunt Meeple, her dexterity game that literally <laughs> is cards and meeples and doing stunts with them on your tabletop it's i saw i saw a picture of that fun. that will be immediately acquired when it becomes a real thing <laughs> <laughs> and, and she's just super fun and encouraging and that's i had a, an 11 year old a friend's 11 year old daughter with me for one of the playtest blocks mm-hmm. uh, she actually came with me last year and it was part of my hit of the con what makes this so special everybody at this con is super encouraging you don't come to unpub to win games mm-hmm. you, you don't play to lose them but you you don't go 
to like compete. You go here to have fun and provide feedback. Mm-hmm. And, and I think there's a brilliant mechanism there of uh, just alignment of interests, right? So my interest is I'm there to have fun. Uh, the designers are there. They're also there to have fun. But there and, and there's a whole lot of late night playtesting after the blocks are over. People are hanging out and having bourbon and other beverages, or not having an adult beverage at all if that's your thing. Uh, but there's that whole sort of con hangout after the official events are over aspect. That's great. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I, I I just truly adored is that when my friend's 11 year old was with me, designers were almost more interested in her feedback as both a girl and a child Mm -hmm. than they were in mine as like a middle-aged white guy, (laughs) which I thought was just, it's, it's brilliant that they're paying attention to that. And if you think about it, designers who may be targeting a age range for their game might be interested in, Hey, do you understand this as an 11 year old kid? Yeah. Do I need to cha- tweak or change mechanics or make rules clear? Uh, I think that's pretty brilliant. Now that's one of the things I'll talk about is rules being clear, artwork being final. If you go to an unpub event, never expect the artwork to be final. <laughs> never expect the rules to be final. Uh, Please don't expect pieces and bits and dice and other things to be anywhere near final because real-time feedback is a thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So you had, I think you narrowed it down to about five games that you saw that you really wanted to talk about. You want to get into a few of those? I can do that. So I have, uh, in in theme, I called it my taster's paddle. I Mm -hmm. don't know if that'll survive the final cut of this uh, show. So I had five. Um, I'm going to start with one of the last games I played on Sunday during the, the morning play t- or the late afternoon playtest block there. Uh, I'm going to talk about Raising Chicago by Matt Wolf. Uh, oh. So Matt designed a game that I played last year um, that I thought was absolutely brilliant, which is called Squaring Circleville. Yeah. That game is so much fun. We played that as well. It's, oh man, I cannot wait to see that get published. And, he told me, actually, this is the brilliant part, so Matt, I'm sorry if you're listening to this and you don't like that I say this. Uh, <laughs> he apparently had been working on that for about 10 weeks before last year's Unpub. Mm-hmm. So, fairly new design. This year's Raising Chicago design is also about six weeks old. That's nice. the one that's so super new. So, this is a Rondell game with two workers. You are gathering resources to make tiles. And it has this mechanic of the last player on the Rondell goes first, um, I don't want to say it's similar to Glenn Moore in that way, but it does use that same sort of yeah. last player on the Rondell moves. And there's an optimal building strategy. Uh, this is a so this is one of those things that I think the interesting shtick about this game is you are in 19th century Chicago where they had legit sewage problems that were causing uh, cholera and dysentery. And one of the problems that they realized is their water table, because of being so close to Lake Michigan, mm-hmm. is too high. So they needed to raise, lift the buildings up, jack them up higher, raise the roads, and maybe even move some old wooden buildings that were in their downtown core to solve this problem. Hmm. So what did Matt do? He made a game about this. That seems to be his his issue right now, is making games about actual cities. And how they were changed. about actual history. Yep. I'm kind of bummed that this is not like raising Arizona, though. (laughs) <laughs> yeah that would have been a better gif in a, a twitter thread yesterday but <laughs> this was just super interesting it's about a two hour euro it's uh, what i would say is probably mid to heavyweight uh, it's still kind of early um there are scoring tracks there's a bit of this that feels like teotihuacan which i don't know if you guys have gotten a table yet or not no, but not yet. um there's a bit of this with sort of different uh, what teotihuacan would call temple threads um and the rondel mechanic but it does feel dramatically different they're nowhere near the same game it's just all the i had similar feels to this that i had with uh, teotihuacan and i thought that was in a good vein i think he's got another potential hit on his hands cool so that's raising chicago Uh, next one i want to talk about is aloha earth from ninth level games Hmm. Uh, this is a game where you might see a hashtag on twitter of uh hashtag cheddar diploma (laughs) okay (laughs) <laughs> why so this is one of those uh so this is one of those judge with funny descriptions games uh ah. the 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 concept of the game is earth has fallen and we are scientists or ministers from a future civilization studying ancient earth civ and we have ministers of 
finance and sport and culture who are describing through their particular lenses things on cards that are about Earth. Now, part of the shtick is they don't know the history of Earth. They just see the words written on tablets or stone or things like that. They don't know what they mean. So you'll see things like uh, cheddar on one card and diploma on another, and the person who is the judge pitches the word and says, hi, Minister of Culture, I would like you to pitch first. And so they come up with their their pitch of what it actually means, and they can justify it and uh, lobby for it, and then other players can can join in. Hmm. Now, one of the things, this is a very you know super fight, cards against uh, stupid people, hmm. um, those uh, fun employed sorts of you know, judge of a funny set of things games. But what's brilliant about it is if you don't have nothing to say, if you have nothing to say, just don't say anything. You don't have to pitch. Um, so it short circuits some of the take time out of a fun party game mechanic mm -hmm. because maybe I don't have a good idea or I just flat out don't have the cards. It's short. People popped in and out throughout the play test period. This actually wasn't even in the formal blocks. This was one after hours. Mm -hmm. um, I actually played with Heather and some of the folks from Ninth Level and other designers who happened to still be around at 2 o'clock in the morning. And it's fun. It's it's a nightcap kind of game. Um, I talk about it just because it takes a unique spin on this in that you are not selecting cards. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at this as a potential very limited number of cards. I don't know that this will fit in a button shy size package, but I think they are looking at something where it's going to be 20 to 30 cards. Okay. But there's a ton of variability. And I think that makes it super interesting and portable. Um, this is from the same studio that makes uh, Kobolds Ate My Baby, I believe. Mm -hmm. So just kind of interesting, fun things. Again, sort of a, a mixed group of designers. Uh, really interesting, fun. So that's Aloha Earth. Okay. Uh, next up is Foliage from Catherine Stipple, who is the designer mm -hmm. around Nyctophobia. So this is a fairly light dexterity game. You'll have leaf cards, and again, the art on this was pretty early, but you'll have leaf cards that have certain colors on them, and a caterpillar who likes to get to be a fatter, bigger, better caterpillar by eating other players' leaves. I'm a fan of this. And each card, each leaf card, will have four different symbols with numbers in them. So you will take, and, and I, Jake can see me in the uh, Skype that we're doing this, you'll take your card, lift it up, and spin it, and let it fall on the table, coming to rest, much like a leaf on the wind. Oh, wait, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> When the leaf settles on the play area, it might be next to or not next to other leaves. Um, and then you will choose a leaf symbol, and it'll have a number on it. And you will use that leaf symbol as an axis for that number of cards, tilting them along that axis, uh, where you've stuck your finger, basically, uh, spinning that around. And if the leaf happens to touch a card that your caterpillar is on, your caterpillar gets to eat that leaf. Mm. And you score bonus points if it matches the color of... Uh, a, the card that your caterpillar is on. Mm -hmm. This one's super early, and I did see that Ian Zhang actually had done some uh, feedback work with uh, Catherine on this game. Mm -hmm. um, I did not get to see what they did afterwards, um, but this is just really short, simple, 30-minute, uh, kind of impressive little dex game. Um, and then you get to rotate your your, your card. You, you drop another card at the end of your turn. Mm -hmm. um, I did see the funny uh, hashtag on, on Twitter on Catherine's feed of drop it like it's fall. So <laughs> you can do that as you will. Nice. Um, and she had another game, too, that I did not get to play, but I stopped by and was watching she and Carla from Weird Draft play. Mm -hmm. I think Saturday night that was a gravity manipulation game. Uh Looked very, very interesting. Look for yeah. something like that, Catherine Stipple. I think she's got some really interesting ideas. I'm interested to know more about that. Anything that's got a, a weird mechanic like gravity manipulation sounds interesting to me. Yeah, she had some pictures after Unpub of new iconography that she's working on mm -hmm. for that uh, gravity game. And I, I honestly don't remember what it was called. I saw it on the table uh, table standee, but I don't remember uh, what she called it. Okay, but take a look for that. Yeah, foliage, but foliage from Catherine Stipple. Mm -hmm. Next up uh, in the Taster's Paddle is Tank Robbers uh, from Anthony and Nicole Amato from Cardboard Fortress. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a tabletop combat. Think, those of us of a certain age, uh, Atari Combat, the game. Yeah. Some, it's very arcadey uh, with strategy. This is an action programming, card programming game, moving tanks around, blowing up buildings, picking up bars of gold because gold helps you win. Mm -hmm. 
um, you're going to end up moving your tank about around the board. Uh, it's pretty light. It's probably 30 to 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Every player has a set of four special uh, actor cards that you uh, can change your player powers as you go through, and they're all different. They're all asymmetric in that way. Uh, there are certain buildings that if you land on them uh, or move to them as you're rolling your tank around the board, you can't stay there, so you keep moving. And it actually lets you hop around the board uh, quicker, or in my case, get shoved around the board uh, and end up in places you did not program your tank to be. <laughs> That's pretty much what you're going to get with a programming game. <laughs> yes, it's it's very much a take that game. So yeah. if you are a Care Bearer, this is probably not your kind of game. Although I think <laughs> with the name like Tank Robbers, that probably gave it away. And, and I say that not to disparage the game. I thought it was brilliant fun, as long as you're expecting a take that kind of game. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was really, really cool. It's fairly light. I like that it's a husband and wife team. Um, who knows? Maybe you guys design something someday. Oh, no. Hard pass. <laughs> <laughs> You'll pass. A, a cat petting game is about all we can uh, manage, I think. There you go. <laughs> um, it, it's, it is, it's very, uh, it seems fairly small. There there were not tons of bits and bobs and components. It's almost all card-based. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I did see that was kind of a, uh, last year I think my theme of Unpub was what I called coopetition. So there were cooperative games that had significant competitive elements to it. Okay. This year, I think designers are trying to make spinning cool again. And this had a spinner for part of the game. Nice. Uh, partly for deciding who gets to go first. Uh, another game I, I'm not talking about here, but uh, one I did enjoy was Keith Ferguson's Trick or Treat, mm -hmm. which also featured a spinner for teenagers running around and uh, smashing pumpkins and getting their <laughs> Trick or Treat candy. Surprise, uh, you're talking about it here now. Yep. Yes, there you go. We so, need to make spinners uh, did, cool again. Yeah, so making spinners cool again seemed to show up in a few places at Unpub, which I thought was neat. Um <laughs> Anyway, so that's that's uh, tank robbers. Mm -hmm. uh, last one that was in my four, my five pack, which this one is my hit of the con. Um, Jake and Danielle, you were married. Uh, I know my wife and I do the same thing. Do you guys ever have the situation of, hey, let's go to dinner? Would you like to go to dinner? <laughs> yes, I'd like to go to dinner. Where would you like to go to dinner? I don't know. Where would you like to go to dinner? Every every meal, all the yes. time. Yes. So. My hit of Unpub, which I totally did not expect and was so pleasantly surprised by, is called Schedule Simulator. And this is by uh, Adi Slepak, Slepak, I believe, mm -hmm. and Liz Lebowski. Um, they are su two super awesome designers. Um, and I ended up playing this twice for playtesting. Wow. And I'll play why in a second. So this game started out as a fairly light strategy, 30-minute sort of uh, game where you are trying to fill your schedule with fun things to do with your friends. <laughs> That's the game. Um, you start off with a, the, their prototype components. They had a folder with seven days of the week and three time slots, so morning, afternoon, and evening, and a certain number of obligations, things like going to work or going to class. Mm -hmm. And then you would like to try and fill those in. Um, you would have a set of cards in your hand, like, uh, hey, let's go out to eat, or let's go to a show. And you might propose, hey, Jake, would you like to go to a show? And Jake, would, Jake, if he has a card in his hand, would say, oh, I'd like to go to a show. Mm -hmm. And then I would propose, hey, you want to go Tuesday night? And Jake would say, no, nah, I can't do Tuesday night, but how about a Thursday matinee? And if we both agree on the, the thing in the time slot, we get to slot it in. Okay. If we don't agree, we would get a frustration token. Frustration bad. <laughs> and if you get three of those, your hand size gets bigger. It also served as a timer for the game. Oh. Um, and so it, you would, one at a time, go around the table proposing events. And the events were worth different amounts of points based on the card. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was super neat in and of itself. That was already a very interesting game. Um but they worked with Ian Zhang, who seemed to appear as if by magic at a whole bunch of designers' tables this weekend, or last <laughs> weekend. And he turned it into, effectively, a real-time game. So take that awkward, that beautiful awkward that makes this game, Ooh. and you turned it into a party game. Okay. I will. I pl so I happened to walk by, and I was like, hey, 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 guys, how are you doing? And just being social for a moment, and uh, seeing how people were enjoying playing this. Because this literally was already my hit of the con. And they were like, ooh, you played this before. Please sit. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we have totally blown up our game. We don't know if it works. Let's see what happens. And we'd like your feedback. And I was happy to give it. Mm -hmm. So 
now it's the same kind of thing, except it's no longer turn-based. You are in real time. You are proposing your events and working out schedule. But here's the catch. You may only speak when your folder, ahem, laptop, is closed. Okay. So now it creates a little bit of a memory aspect to it. But now instead of very easily being able to look at your cards and look at your available time slots, you have to know it's going to work. Yeah, so you've got to remember that you already scheduled something for that Thursday night. Right. You're about, oh, man. And you might have – there are special power cards that let you, like, blow off obligations um, or let you blow off a friend, which is (laughs) great. It can actually change your your scoring significantly. There were end-of-round or end-of-game special powers cards for things like scoring, uh, having the most fun events at night for, like, Night Owl or um, Let's Go to the Show, and you are the (laughs) the person who gets to go to the most theater events or whatever. Yeah. Uh, One of the things I think they're going to significantly expand is – they had cards that will show up as you're drawing to replace your hand to refill Mm -hmm. that were obligations and you are required because it's an obligation to fill those in on your schedule immediately. Um, And that was always true even in the the original version, but they're going to in theme make a lot more of this about adulting, like your two thirds, you have to go to the dentist, Uh, your car breaks down, you have to go to the repair shop, Hmm. you got jury duty. So it's going to be some of the obligations and some of the fun things will be more adulty kinds of things and they're turning this more into a real-time four to eight player party style game that sounds really neat yeah and the the game ends because it's real time now the new trigger instead of this frustration token mechanic is somebody fills their schedule yeah with anything not just with fun stuff so you could draw a whole bunch of obligations and still lose the game you Mm -hmm. can have your full schedule but still lose and it creates a lot of unpredictability which i think is brilliant in something like this Mm i i didn't intend to go to unpub playing a lot of party games um but this was i I will get this to table all the time this is super super fun and um the two designers uh that i ended up talking to i thought they were uh really really sharp and really smart and they they took something that I think is emblematic both of uh well raising chicago aloha earth and schedule and even tank robbers Embrace your weird. What makes your game special? Um, uh, Rob Davio talked about this in his keynote. Uh, Quan Chai talked about this in his, his keynote. Uh, what makes your game special? Like, yeah. There are going to be 4,000 games that come out this year or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they didn't say this precisely, but I think the thing that I took from this is kind of the other mega theme from Unpub is lean into your weird. Mm-hmm. Um, draft mechanic does that with beer and board games and the beer primer and all these other really cool segments that you guys do. And I'm so mm-hmm. appreciative that you, uh, invited me to be on this week, but, yeah. um, I, I think that's super interesting that so many designers could do something that was just kind of vanilla, very samey, samey about normal board games today. But instead, many of them are leaning into, Hey, let's make a game about Soviet era Fox research that Elizabeth Hargrave is working on mm-hmm. or, moving a meeple around cards and dropping them off things with stunt meeple um, or scheduling things, uh, yeah. ancient earth. I mean, it's just, it's just the, there's a lot of variety um, in, in a lot of this. There were some other really cool ones. Uh, just I'll throw out some names of, of a couple of other things I, I'd be remiss without saying. Uh, to Tame a Fox and Stunt Meeple, as with Hargrave, I talked about DNA Inc. from Julio and Nazario. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cairn or Karn by Mark McGee and Josh Mills. Uh, Scouts by Stephen B. Davies, which I think that one's probably heading to market pretty soon. Keep your eyes out for that one. I enjoyed that one. Uh, Nice little worker placement game. And Flower Fusion from Eugene Bryant. And we already know about our friends uh, doing Garten Bow. So Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be super, super neat. Yeah, it sounds like, and that's kind of exciting. You know, we've talked a lot in the last few months about how games are coming up with really interesting and exciting themes. And it seems like, you know, when you get to go to an unpub like this, you're kind of taking a peek into the future and you're seeing even more of that crazy new themes, new innovations, new ideas. Exactly. I I think that's the brilliant part of it is you're getting to see lots of divergent new ideas. Uh, You're getting to see them from diverse voices and people. Mm -hmm. And because you're giving your feedback, they may be pulling something in that you care about making their game even better and making you more able to play it more often. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, this does very much have the cult of the new aspect to it. Um, but at the same time, there are lots of games with even a classic feel at this. I mean, again, I, I joke about tank robbers being combat from Atari. 
the board game. Mm-hmm. Not quite literally, and please don't sue anybody on this, Atari. Uh, but it is a, it's a fun game, uh, and, and there are lots of things like that that are just so so diverse and new mm-hmm. um, and, and feel fresh, and your feedback can have some, some real benefits. So I highly recommend if you are looking for something to do around Memorial Day week next year uh, during Unpub 10, um, come up to Hunt Valley, and uh, I'll buy you around. Awesome. All right. Well, Will, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Um, you know, hopefully next year we'll get a chance to pop up to Unpub if it uh, works into the schedule. But it's always, you know, a pleasure to talk to you and pleasure to hear about some awesome new games. Indeed. Indeed. Safe driving, everybody. All righty. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Draft Mechanic. Thank you all again for listening. New returning listeners, tell a friend, tell an acquaintance, tell your cat, tell your cat about Draft Mechanic. They Don't won't tell your understand. Cat. Your cat doesn't have a phone. He doesn't care. The cat doesn't care. He just wants to go back to sleep. Anyway, draftmechanic.net, your one stop shop for all your draft mechanic needs at Draft Mechanic or on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all the usual good old places, draftmechanic at gmail.com. If you want to send an email to us and draftmechanic.bird. It's not a website yet, but maybe I can do that. No. No. I've bought boardgames.beer. I think I'm good on novelty websites for a bit. Indeed. We also have a Board Game Geek Guild that is guild number 2470. There will be a thread for this episode as there is for every episode, so let us know what you think about what we were talking about. If you happen to be in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, our next game night is going to be on Thursday, April 4th at Good Road Cider Works, and the one after that will be on the third Tuesday of April at Salud Cerveceria. Mm -hmm. And there's always information on those at boardgames.beer slash events if you want to go there. Draft Mechanic is sponsored by Gray Fox Games. Visit grayfoxgames.com and sign up for their newsletter for the latest. Gray Fox Games, quality games, cleverly crafted. Danielle, I think we're going to get this done under two... Oh, dang it, that was the two-hour mark. As always, I would like to remind our listeners to please game responsibly and tell them that I'll see them back here in two weeks for another round. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Draft Mechanic Episode 98 was recorded on Sunday, March 31st, 2019 in front of a live studio cat. He just wants to go back to sleep. in your eyes, you are the beholder. You render me stricken. Do not go gently. Hey, Board Gamers, BJ from Board Game Gumbo here, back with more Louisiana flavor. Tornado Michien, we love talking board games. That's why we started up Gumbo Live, the number one Facebook live talk show dedicated to board gaming. Each week, we interview guests from your hobby, publishers, designers, content creators, and you get to ask them whatever you like. It's a live show. So join us at Board Game Gumbo on Facebook every Tuesday night at 8.30 p.m. Central for another episode of Gumbo Live. And until next time... Laissez-les bon temps rouler. Punchboard Media. Where we all bring something to the table. Pull up a chair. At punchboardmedia.com.